Okay, good afternoon. I am uh, Council Member Daniel Drum, and I'll be chairing the Committee on Civil Service and Labor for today's hearing. I know the topic of paid parental leave for New York City's municipal workforce is an important one uh, to the chair of this committee, my fellow colleague, I. Denique Miller, but unfortunately, he's not able to uh, join us here today. I would also like to extend a welcome to the chair of the Committee on Education, Mark Traeger, to whom I know this is also an important issue that the city needs to tackle. Finally, I'd like to thank everyone here today for coming out this afternoon to this hearing. Today, we'll be holding a joint oversight hearing with the Committee on Education, as well as hearing two resolutions. The oversight topic will be paid parental leave for New York City's municipal employees, and the resolutions will be resolution number 311 and resolution number 312. Resolution number 311, introduced by Council Members Kumbo, Traeger, Powers, and Levin, calls upon the City of New York to extend paid family leave benefits to all city employees represented by a municipal union. Currently, only a small fraction of the New York City government workforce enjoys such a benefit. Majority Leader, the Majority Leader will speak to this resolution shortly. Resolution number 312, which, introduced, which was introduced by Council Member Traeger, calls upon the New York Legislature to pass and the Governor to sign legislation to amend the State Paid Family Leave Act to provide employees covered by the Act with a benefit equal to 100 percent of such employees' average weekly wage. While Councilmember Traeger will speak more specifically to policies within the Department of Education, I'd like to take a few minutes to speak to paid family leave in general. Not many may be aware of this extremely disappointing fact but the United States is the only developed country in the world to not have a national paid parental leave policy. Consider this sobering fact. As of 2017, only five states offered paid family leave programs. California, New York, New Jersey, for private employers only. Rhode Island and Washington, as well as the District of Columbia. It is clear that states and municipalities, including this one, have so much more to do. New York City has always been at the forefront of innovative policy solutions to intractable problems that have served as a model to the rest of the country. As it often goes, what New York City does, others will follow. We should be leading on this important issue. What exactly is paid parental leave? Paid parental leave is providing paid time off to new parent employees to recover from the birth of a child or to care for or bond with a new child separate from other paid time off programs like vacation and sick time. These programs typically apply to both mothers and fathers. Case studies and examples from implemented policies across the world are clear in one simple fact. The benefits of a paid parental leave policy outweigh the cost. More importantly, these policies fill a critical gap in the safety net. A 2011 study that analyzed the relationship between social policy and global health in 141 countries with paid leave policies found that paid parental leave can reduce infant mortality by as much as 10 percent. Further studies have shown that paid parental leave policies have led to increased infant immunizations and increases in the rate and duration of breastfeeding. According to the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, babies that are breastfed are li less likely to get a variety of infections and are at lower risk for sudden infant death syndrome. There are benefits to mothers too. For example, according to the CDC, mothers who breastfeed are less likely to get cancer, ovarian cancer, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease. Clearly, the benefits to public health and well-being of mothers, fathers, and children cannot be overstated. The United States is completely lacking in this support system as compared to other countries. For example, in Finland, mothers are guaranteed approximately four months of paid leave and fathers are covered for nine weeks immediately following the birth of a child. In Norway, 46 weeks of parental leave at 100% of pay is provided, of which up to 14 can be taken by the father. In the United Kingdom, eligible employees can be paid up to 39 weeks of statutory maternity pay and in Canada, one, pay, one, one year of paid maternal leave. The world is leading on this issue. In 1991, President Bill Clinton signed into law the Family and Medical Leave Act, 
which is a federal law that provides certain employees with up to 12 weeks of unpaid job protected leave per year, while also requiring that their group benefits be maintained during the leave. However, the Family Medical Leave Act does not do enough due to the strict requirements accompanied by the law, with an estimated 40% of American workers not qualifying for, qualifying for Family Medical Leave Act. This ultimately hurts the American family due to a lack of time and compensation to raise a new child. When the Family Medical Leave Act came into existence, many activists and politicians believed that it would cover, that, it, that Family Medical Leave um, Act coverage and parental leave policies as a whole would expand to the majority of workers and become paid leave. This, however, has not occurred, leaving a large gap in parental leave policies throughout the nation. Notably, in 2018, comprehensive paid family leave policy for private employees throughout New York State took effect. However, this employee-funded program does not provide 100% of pay, and it does not apply to public sector workers unless their employer opts in. This has left a large group of people uncovered and without access to paid parental leave policies. New York City municipal employees are left out of this state mandate. Our hearing today looks at this large exclusion of New York City's municipal employees from receiving paid parental leave. Increasingly, we have seen numerous stories of New York City municipal employees who have no form of paid parental leave and are forced to choose between work and family, ultimately hurting the workforce and families altogether. Most notably, we have seen numerous reports of teachers under the Department of Education that have no paid parental leave and are forced to use all of their accumulated vacation and or sick time in order to simply care for their child. Efforts have been made by the city to change this dynamic, yet more needs to be done. In 2016, Mayor de Blasio signed a personnel order providing six weeks of paid parental leave to approximately 20,000 non-represented New York City employees. However, this does not apply to city employees that are covered by collective bargaining agreement. This order, although well-intended, has not effectively dealt with the problem, the lack of paid parental leave within the New York City government workforce. This hearing today will help us further examine this issue, and I certainly look forward to hearing from today's witnesses on what can be done to provide this critically needed health benefit to our government workers. I would like to thank my colleague, Councilmember Traeger, for jointly holding today's hearing, my staff, the staff on both committees for preparing this hearing, as well as the Committee on Civil Service and Labor Staff. Malcolm, our counsel, Kevin, the policy analyst, and Kendall, the finance analyst. And I now turn to my colleague, the chair of the Committee on Education, Council Member Mark Traeger, for his opening remark. Thank you, Chair Drum. And before I begin my opening statement, I'd like to express my disappointment that the New York City Department of Education chose not to attend today's hearing, a department that boasts of equity and excellence for all, a department that testified at my budget hearing that it is concerned about the retention of quality educators in, in our system, chose not to attend today's hearing on paid parental leave. That choice and that decision speaks volume to this committee and to this council. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to welcome you today to you to today's oversight hearing on paid parental leave for New York City municipal employees. I want to thank Chair Miller for his unwavering uh, effort with fighting for the rights of city employees. I'd like to also thank Council Member Daniel Drum for co-chairing this hearing today on behalf of Council Member Miller and also thank him for his advocacy for paid parental leave for New York City municipal employees. Providing employees with paid parental leave is not only morally right, but it is also proven by research to be beneficial for families. Studies show that mothers who take paid parental leave experience fewer postpartum depression symptoms and have stronger bonds with their children. In addition to increasing breastfeeding, as, as explained by my co-chair, paid parental leave also increases the likelihood of newborns receiving well 
baby care and vaccinations. I'd like to uh, also highlight that paid parental leave, when inclusive of fathers, promotes gender equity in the workplace and at home. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, fathers taking paternity leave may increase income for mothers and can have a positive effect on women's wages and labor participation. Further, paid parental leave is positively associated with producing benefits for vulnerable populations. A study found that California's paid family leave program resulted in an increase of unmarried, minority, and less educated mothers taking leave. And according to the U.S. Departments of Labor, this suggests that California's program may give children from challenging backgrounds early life health benefits. With all of these benefits of paid parental leave, we applaud uh, the mayor's efforts on establishing a paid parental leave policy by personnel ordering. However, we must acknowledge that the policy falls woefully short of reaching the majority of our city workers. In fact, the mayor's policy, which only affects 20,000 New York City employees, does not include unionized municipal employees who represent 91% of the city's workforce. Our unionized municipal employees represent some of the hardest working employees in our city. They include our police officers, our firefighters, our teachers, and many others who keep our city safe and functioning properly for its over 8 million residents. These dedicated city workers should not have to sacrifice their hard-earned income to care for their newborn child. As a former educator, I would also like to express my concern about the parental leave policies affecting employees at the Department of Education, particularly teachers who must use their sick time during parental leave. DOE's maternal leave policy allows birth mothers to use their accrued sick time, of which they accrue 10 days per year, for up to six weeks after childbirth and up to eight weeks if they receive a C-section. With DOE's policy, it could take a teacher three years to accrue enough sick days to take maternal leave and four years if they require a C-section. DOE teachers who do not have enough sick days to cover their leave can borrow up to 20 sick days, but this can also be problematic. For example, after borrowing 20 sick days to bond with their newborn child, teachers will not have any sick days left, and teachers who cannot afford to lose a day's pay may be forced to go into work sick or while their child is sick. Furthermore, it can take teachers two years or more to pay back the sick days they owe DOE. Let me be very clear. Caring for a child is not a sickness or disability, and it is unfair to require teachers to use their sick time during, pay, during the parental leave. It is also concerning that DOE's parental leave policy for teachers is not inclusive of fathers, foster parents, or adoptive parents who would also benefit from paid parental leave. Our city celebrates inclusion, gender equity, and tolerance, and parental leave policy should reflect these values. Furthermore, our teachers dedicate their lives to caring for, nurturing, and supporting our city's children. They should not endure financial hurdles when trying to do the same for their own. As a former teacher, I know of many great educators who love teaching but chose to leave the profession because of DOE's current parental leave policy. Many of them have cited hardships with accumulating enough sick days to take maternity leave. Recent reports have also highlighted that DOE is having difficulties retaining their teachers, and I am particularly interested in learning more about how DOE's lack of paid parental leave policy impacts DOE's overall teacher retention. As my co-chair mentioned, our country is the only developed country in the world to not offer paid parental leave to employees. Simply put, it is alarming that in the 21st century, all municipal employees who work in one of the richest cities in the world do not have access to paid parental leave while many of their private sector counterparts do. Many private companies operating in our city, such as Amazon, American Express, and Ernst & Young have joined the rest of the world by offering paid parental leave to their employees that is inclusive of fathers, adoptive, adoptive parents, and foster parents. New York City must do the same 
for our municipal employees. I'd like to say how pleased I am to be the prime sponsor of Resolution uh, 312, which calls upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation to amend the State Paid Family Leave Act to provide workers in New York State with a benefit equal to 100% of an employee's average weekly wage. It is time we move forward on this issue. Today's hearing will also uh, will provide an opportunity for the administration to respond to the concerns raised, as well as for unions, uni unionized employees, advocates, and other stakeholders to share their concerns and recommendations related to paid parental leave for New York City municipal employees. Thank you to my uh, committee staff, uh, Smita Deshmukh, Jan Atwell, Kalima John Johnson, Joan Pavoni, Caitlin O'Hagan, Elizabeth Hoffman, and Millie Bonilla. I like to also thank my staff, Anna Scaife, Vanessa Ogle, and Eric Feinberg. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to my colleague, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, for her remarks on resolution number 311. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Today I've joined this hearing to show my full support for paid parental leave in our city and state. The City of New York continues to be a national leader in addressing gender equity, reproductive justice, and workers' rights. Mayor Bill de Blasio has created solutions such as the amazing UPK program, which is continually expanding the boundaries of how families in New York City can grow and thrive. Through an executive order, we've provided six weeks of paid parental leave to 20,000 public employees, making New York City among the most generous municipal family leave providers in the nation. But yet, we have so much more to do. Resolution number 311, which I am proud to bring to the forefront, is a resolution calling upon New York City to extend paid family leave benefits to city employees covered by municipal unions. During my first term in office, I proudly served as chairperson of the Women's Issues Committee and co-chair of the Women's Caucus. I have seen firsthand how our city's policies, resources, and laws have provided crucial protections and empowerment opportunities for the hardworking people and families in this city. During this time, personally, and my staff have been overwhelmed by constituents of both my district and outside the confines of the 35th Council District expressing dismay around the mayor's six-week paid parental leave to 20,000 public employees. Sentiments included, why am I not covered by the mayor's parental leave? Why do I have to bear the financial burden of child rearing and family emergency when others are paid for for such life changes? And why does New York State's governor, Andrew Cuomo's paid family leave, not cover me? I even thought, how is this possible? How are the hardest working public servants in the city and state getting overlooked in our parental leave laws? And all I could truly say to constituents was that I was going to fight for them to expand these policies and laws. And as I closed out my first term, I became a mom and began to feel and see all that we had worked on had a, as a city became real firsthand. While we are advocating for at least three months of paid family leave, I know as a new mom, what we really need is a whole year. But that's for another term and that's for another um, hearing. I have always valued and placed great emphasis on providing my workers time to bond with their newborns. While I've been at the City Council, I've had five employees out on paid family leave at different times. Yes, it was hard to manage, but it was well worth it, and the team pulled together. And to all the constituents that reached out with the questions on why they were not covered for family leave, I made a personal promise to these amazing families that they deserve better, and I will fight for them. I am overjoyed today that we can finally peel back the layers and look at this challenge we are faced with in the City of New York. Today, as we explore these topics. Let's continue to fight and remember that the mayor has granted six weeks of fully, pa fully paid parental leave to 20,000 public employees that are non-union and holding manager titles, and this is a great first step. Resolution 311 directly correlates to this order in which this resolution is calling upon New York City to extend paid family leave benefits to city employees covered by municipal unions. And I just want to add in closing, um, while this is great a great resolution and an incredibly important hearing. I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that uh, 
what we see in magazines and television in terms of having a child would make it seem like it's the most seamless process in the world. But there are so many families, uh, so many women that have challenges all throughout their entire pregnancy that require them to be on bed rest, um, to require them to not be able to work um, as diligently as they might have. There are so many mothers that after giving birth have a lot of physical challenges afterwards. And in addition, there are so many children that are born with disabilities or premature that require additional support. So what we're discussing today is just baseline. It's just what every human being should need. Um, and once we work, because I know we will work and we will win um, to address this, I think we need to even push the boundaries even further to make sure that the entire process of be bringing life into the world um, is given as much support um, and protections as every child need, because a child is such a blessing um, and such a gift to this world, and we need to treat it as such. So I thank Council Member uh, Mark Traeger for this very important hearing, and I look forward to continuing to add my advocacy and fight for all of our working families. Thank you. Thank you very much, Majority Leader Cumbo, and um, I also just wanted to comment a little bit about uh, Chair Traeger's remarks. Before being elected to the city council, I was a New York City public school teacher as well. And at the press conference, I mentioned that um, there was a boy in my class who got pink eye five times, which meant that I got pink eye five times. And um, you know, I had to take off each of those five days. And since I've been in the council, I have not taken one sick day. So just by virtue of being a teacher in the New York City public school system, you make yourself much more susceptible to these types of illnesses, never mind having to try to make up those sick days because you owe time uh, because you were out on uh, parental leave or whatever. So this is a very important issue to this council. And uh, we are very, very glad to be joined now uh, by other council members, council member Adams, council member Cohen, council member Brannon, council member uh, Rose, and council member Salamanca, and I already mentioned our majority leader, Lori Cumbo. Uh, and with that, I'd now like to ask Robert Lindsay uh, Director of the Office of Labor Relations to please come and to be sworn in and to give testimony. If you would just raise your right hand, Commissioner. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? And for the record, if you could just state your name and title and begin when you're ready. Now on or off? Robert W. Lynn, Commissioner of New York City's Office of Labor Relations. So thank you, Chair Traeger, Chair Drum, Majority Leader Cumbo, members of the Education and Civil Service Committee for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today on the topic of paid parental leave for New York City employees. I am Bob Lynn, Commissioner of New York City's Office of Labor Relations. As you're aware, when Mayor de Blasio took office and appointed me as Labor Commissioner, Every single collective bargaining agreement in the city had expired, some for three years, some for five years, others for more. At that time, the priority of the administration was to reach long-term responsible settlements for the entire workforce. We were able to do that. For the 2010 to 17 round of bargaining, we have now settled with 99.9% .9 of the workers, we have reached collective bargaining agreements for that entire group. We achieve these agreements by treating unions with respect and partners at the negotiating table. I'm proud of our accomplishments to date, but our work isn't done. Those contracts are now expiring on a rolling basis, and we have already begun negotiations for the next round of bargaining. One important topic in those negotiations is the very topic of this hearing, paid parental leave. I thank the Council for highlighting this important benefit. It can have a deep, positive impact on our municipal workforce. 
As part of previous negotiations, the administration has successfully bargained benefits which affect employees' family lives. Most notably, we reached agreements with the Municipal Labor Committee for $3.4 billion of health care savings, which created significant changes in the area of health benefits. In addition, as part of the contracts we reached with 1199 SEIU, United Healthcare Workers East, and, New York, and the New York State Nurses Association, the city and the unions agreed to set up first of a kind child care and elder care funds for members' dependents. The parties agreed to a new tuition and continuing education fund, which provides for reimbursement for tuition for approved courses and workshops. These are all examples of benefits the city can provide unionized municipal employees through a serious, respectful, collective bargaining process. It's been my experience since I started in the labor field in 1974, 44 years ago, that bargaining policy and making proposals in public is counterproductive to the collective bargaining process. It's my experience that an arm's length, respectful, private negotiation between labor and management is the best way to achieve successful results on important topics like this one. For that reason, it would be inappropriate for me to speak today in detail about our progress with any particular union. However, I must benefit, uh, emphasize that this benefit, paid parental leave, is a priority for the city in our ongoing bargaining. And we're optimistic that we will make settlements with our other union partners as we did in 2014 and over the last several years. We regard paid parental leave, as you know, uh, with regard to that paid parental leave, as you know, a little over two years ago, as was mentioned, the city implemented paid parental leave for managers and other non-unionized employees. Under this program, eligible employees can take, work up, can take up to 30 work days of paid parental leave once in every uh, rolling 12-month period and 100% of their regular salary. This was implemented without increasing costs for city taxpayers because the benefit provided for the managers, which there is, where there is no collective bargaining, it provided for a cancellation of a 0.47% wage increase, uh, and that for all these employees, we eliminated the accrual of the 26th and 27th days of annual leave for managers with 15 more years of service. The 30 work days, equivalent to six weeks, is paid at 100% of salary and can be combined with existing leave, accrued sick leave, and or vacation time. This allows manager employees to take additional time from maternity, paternity, adoption, or foster care without losing pay. Since these employees are non-unionized, and I stress that, we did it for the non-unionized employees, we were able to implement this benefit via personnel order without collective bargaining. The city intends to review the managerial program at the end of this fiscal year and in order to review whether or not changes would be appropriate based on the full year's usage of fiscal 18. So at that point, we can see exactly what the utilization has been with the first full year of implementation, uh, and we can see how it compares to the 0.47% wage increase in the two days of annual leave um, that was reduced uh, in order to make the benefit possible. At that point, we might make uh, modifications that would be appropriate uh, once we review the data at the end of this fiscal year. For our unionized employees, paid parental leave is a mandatory subject of bargaining under the Taylor Law. And so implementation for any of our 144 collective bargaining units would require agreement between the city and the union representing those employees. Reaching agreement on this topic is a critical goal of this administration, and again, we hope to do so in the coming weeks and months. From a policy perspective, this administration is clearly supportive of paid parental leave as an important benefit that should be part of a total compensation package for public sector employees. Paid parental leave proves maternal and child care outcomes uh, and child outcomes 
citywide and ensures the city can retain a diverse and talented workforce. But paid parental leave doesn't exist in a vacuum. It should be viewed in conjunction with employees' wages and benefits. The main categories of compensation for city employees, wages, pension benefits, health benefits, and time off, paid and unpaid. When looking at paid parental leave issue, these existing areas of compensation must be part of the discussion, as indeed they were when the managerial benefit was implemented. This further goes to show that this must be addressed at the bargaining table as part of the economic package. Historically, city employees have used existing types of paid leave for childcare purposes. Most city employees earn up to 27 days of annual leave over, uh, per year, over five weeks, which is generous in comparison to public and private sector employers. Employees are generally permitted to carry up to two years' worth of accruals from one year to the next which means that long-term employees could bank as many as 54 days for potential use. Many employees or new moms and dads have used annual leave early in the child's life. In addition, most city employees receive 12 sick days per year and up to three of those 12 days can be used for personal illness of a family member. Sick leave has also historically been used by city employees for parental purposes. Most city employees also earn compensatory time, which can be used in the same way as annual leave. We believe that any discussion about paid parental leave must account for those other type of leaves as part of the equation. And again, I'd like to intend, uh, I'd like to emphasize that we also believe this benefit is extraordinarily important. And that's why in good faith we will bargain over this issue with each of our 144 collective bargaining units. For those interested in paid parental leave, our intent is to reach an agreement that includes paid parental leave as part of the overall settlement. And we hope to reach a settlements that are fair and responsible Paid parental leave, we agree, is extraordinarily important. The law requires that paid parental leave be part of our labor negotiations. And that's why we are bringing to the table the issue of paid parental leave in all of our negotiations. It's my hope that we will be able to report in the not too distant future settlements with some of our major unions that will include a paid parental leave benefit. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, I'd like to say we've been joined by Councilmember Deutsch, Meisel, Ulrich, and Lander, and um, I'll start off with a few questions. Um, can you share the total cost and then break down by agency of what it would cost to provide paid parental leave to the city's municipal workforce at a 100% benefit rate, uh, fully, funded, fully funded out of the city budget? So I can only say this, that when we initially um, agreed to provide the benefit uh, and decided to provide the benefit for the uh, managers and non-represented employees. We initially calculated that the cost of providing that benefit was about 0.6 percent. That was based on uh, looking at the citywide workers overall uh, and making estimates based on not having a lot of information at that time. If that number were, to, were accurate, and if that number were to then be used to assess the cost for all city workers, um, right now a one percentage point wage increase costs $425 million per year. So that a benefit that would cost roughly six-tenths of a point, a little bit more, would cost about $250 million per year. If you looked at that over a financial plan, that would be about a billion dollars. So this is not based on a current estimate. This was based on the estimates that we reached when we initially looked at this issue for managers. Um, and the actual cost of what it would apply for any particular bargaining unit is exactly the sort of uh, process that we are now going through with some of the city's major unions and we are seeking to assess in that 
uh, process um, in that uh, forum uh, what these costs would look like. Okay, uh, what are some of the uh, challenges in implementing um, the paid parental leave program for the workforce? Excuse me, I, I didn't. What are, what are some of the challenges? Are there additional challenges outside of just uh, finding the money, or other challenges? Are there other challenges? Well, there are two sets of, of at least two sets. One one issue clearly is the cost of the benefit, um, and we believe that any benefit that has a substantial cost, however important, um, should be part of the labor process. Uh, that workers have uh, receive wages, benefits, they receive health benefits, which is obviously a very important issue uh, and a very costly one. Um, and that fitting in a new benefit uh, within the context of the overall package is one that I think is critically important um, and should be left to the bargaining table. And that is the area and the domain that the law provides that uh, mandatory subjects of bargaining should be considered and should be resolved. The second issue in terms of how the implementation works, uh, that is critically important. And that is one of the issues that we've had lengthy conversations with uh, um, at least one union that uh, you may be hearing from later today uh, of exactly what would be the application uh, of the benefit. Uh, what happens during different uh, times of the year? Um, what type of notification is appropriate? What, uh, um, what type of approach should be used to be able to deliver the critically important services that the city provides? So again, that's another area, the implementation of the particular benefit that must be left to the parties to come up with a process that works for them. And I, and I have to say, the, the, the fact that we have 144 bargaining units um, is evidence of very, very different uh, communities of interest among different employees, and the nature of a benefit could look very different uh, from one group to another, from one agency to another. And I really think the, uh, the genius of collective bargaining is leaving to the parties the ability to find wise solutions to complicated problems. Is the city um, currently experiencing any difficulties um, surrounding this issue in terms of either recruitment or retention of city workers because uh, for the majority of people, this benefit is not offered? I have not heard this presented as a central issue of recruitment and retention. That's not to say that I don't believe it's an extraordinarily important benefit. Um, so I haven't heard that it is, it is critical uh, to attract and retain, but on the other hand, I believe it is an important benefit that should be part of this round of bargaining, and you, you have my commitment um, that I take this matter very seriously, um, and the city uh, has, has presented and presents in its bargaining the desire to reach some sort of a uh, solution that works for both sides. Does the city track why uh, workers might leave their profession at all for any reason? I believe that the exit interviews are done by agencies, perhaps done by DCAS, but I'm, I'm not part of that process. Okay, so you don't know that this has come up in any of those uh, exit I do not interviews. know the results of that. Let me ask you another question. Um, how uh, would this, or how does it apply in, what is, in the area where you've done, uh, where you've implemented uh, paid parental leave to um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender families? How does the benefit apply to those families? Well, it's certainly, and I, I, am, I am with here with my first deputy, um, Renee Campion, so to the extent that she wants to augment any of my uh, uh, answers that uh, I would ask her to do that, um, I believe that any, any couple uh, that were to uh, adopt uh, a child would, would, would clearly be covered by it in, the, uh, in terms of the managerial benefit. Um, and it's provided that the event of, the, uh, of a child uh, being adopted would be, would be part of it, or a, or a birth uh, to one of the, uh, the members of the couple. So would it have to be to married couples or domestic partners? Does that play into it at all? Domestic partners. It's, it, it's, hi, Renee Campion, the first deputy at OLR. And we're gonna so have to swear you in, I think, as well. Okay. Uh-oh. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I feared that from the <laughs> earlier part. Uh, if you could raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do.
Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So um, the the uh, the personnel policy that was executed by the mayor in January 2016 specifically says that um, the parent, um, regardless of gender, um, either of the parents, regardless of gender, um, are entitled and are eligible for that benefit. So that would mean even if the child is adopted or biological. Correct. Yes. Adoption, foster, or birth. Okay, and then that. Domestic partner or married status would not matter there. Um, I just want to review. I would have to ask DCAS okay. on on domestic. I believe both. I am absolute. I'm almost certain that domestic partner is. I just don't know what um, requirements are on. Okay. All right. So uh, in the order. A uh, parent is defined as um, the person identified on the children's birth certificate, adoption certificate, or a certified copy of a foreign adoption order that's been registered in the state. So the person had to have been eligible to be um, on the child's uh, certificate, either birth certificate or adoption certificate. And do you know what that eligibility requirement is? Do you, could a domestic partner be on a birth certificate? If they were well, adopted I, together? I don't, I don't think we know. I mean, I'd have to. Why don't we get a good back with it? Okay, why don't we research that issue? And we'll well, okay, that would be it. great. And I, I do think that, you know, it's something that we should take in consideration as we move down the road in all of the negotiations mm -hmm. that you're going to conduct moving forward. Yes. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chair Traeger now for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Drum, and uh, welcome, Commissioner Wynn. Uh, Commissioner Wynn, do you believe that raising a family is a sickness or disability? <laughs> I have not found it to be. So, why does the city of New York continue to force city workers to use sick days to care for a newborn? So let me, let me say this. Um, traditionally throughout the country, um, sick pay is, has been used as a uh, not adequate but element uh, of the provision of a sick leave benefit. Um, we have uh, a benefit of a uh, parental leave benefit for mothers who give birth. We believe firmly that we should expand this benefit. I think we demonstrated in the benefit that we established for managers and unrepresented employees how much we believe that this is a benefit that should be part of our compensation system. We viewed at that time that we had a benefit structure that could support reallocating uh, some of the benefits and, and wages in order to, um, to repurpose dollars and days off in order to provide a very important benefit. And I am proud of the work we did for managers, and I, I'm glad to hear um, that it has been used by staff uh, of the uh, majority leader and that, uh, uh, that in fact people want a similar benefit. Uh, it is our hope um, that a similar type of benefit can be, uh, uh, can, can be created, can be part of bargaining. Um, you know, I did a lot of negotiations with the teachers uh, when I arrived here. As you recall, the most significant thing in those negotiations were the fact that the prior administration had denied teachers two 4% increases. Um, and the prior administration said that those increases should not be paid. The times had changed um, and that there was no room, there was no money in the budget uh, to restore those two 4% increases. Um, that was centrally important in those negotiations and many people said the city couldn't possibly reach a settlement um, with the 150,000 workers who Bloomberg administration denied the two 4% increases. With that, the many commentators said the city would go bankrupt 
um, in, in order to, uh, to make those payments. It simply was too much back pay. Um, and we figured out a solution that worked for labor and management and the taxpayers um, and the public. Um, and we solved a problem that many said was insurmountable. And I'm very proud of it. The administration is very proud of doing it. I believe that the issue of paid parental leave is another incredibly important issue that needs to be left to the bargaining table for us to reach a solution. I believe that, it, uh, uh, that as contracts expire, um, workers are coming to the table, union leaders are coming to the table to negotiate over this benefit. And I believe that we will have, uh, for many if not all of the workers, agreements where sick leave is not the exclusive benefit, uh, but is, can be used as part of an overall benefit uh, and as part of an overall agreement that I hope to reach in the not too distant future. So, so Commissioner Lynn, the point of this hearing is not to get into the weeds of negotiations between your office and the unions. The point of this hearing is to discuss the public consequences of not having an existing paid parental leave policy in place in the city of New York. I'm going to share with you and my colleagues in the public uh, an educator uh, who messaged me that says, I lost my sick days and had to borrow 20 more to allow me to stay home with my son for his first months of life. It is so sad. Once I returned, I had no sick days and owed the DOE 20 days, not to mention that my mother developed stage four cancer and was in her last few months of life. That year ended for, for me not getting paid for so many days between grief new baby worries and colds and having nearly a mental breakdown. This is what we're trying to get at, Commissioner Lynn. There are serious public health consequences not having an existing policy in place. There are serious issues that we have with regards to the retention of quality city workers. The Department of Education testified at my budget hearing recently that they are concerned and they are seeing data that we're seeing that they're having difficulty retain, retaining quality workers. This speaks to this issue, Commissioner Lynn. Um, why doesn't the city of New York have a policy beyond the 20,000 managerial positions? Why doesn't the city have a policy for adoption, uh, for fostering, and for paternal leave? So you're s speaking to the chief labor spokesperson of an administration that does believe in this benefit. It's not like I'm coming to the table and disagreeing with you um, that this isn't a worthy objective. I agree with you it should be part of negotiations. I agree with you it should be something that we achieve. Um, and I believe that we will make tremendous progress here. Uh, there are a lot of very important benefits that workers receive, uh, of which health benefits is one of the most important. Um, and we constantly um, struggle to figure out how to provide health benefits um, in a way that is efficient, as effective, uh, as cost effective as possible with the absolute minimal uh, of, uh, of shifting costs from the employer to the employee. Uh, that's also an, a, criti a critically important benefit that's part of the overall negotiations. Um, it is my hope that when we're done with these negotiations, we will have improved the overall package uh, and that we will have looked at the, co the, the total um, collection of wages and benefits uh, and time off and we will have improved it. And I believe that focusing on uh, paid parental leave is a very important part of that discussion and I hope that we can, uh, that I can then uh, come forward in the, uh, in the time to come and talk to this panel over what we've achieved in collective bargaining. And I hope the reaction will be uh, that we've made great progress in that area. Commissioner Wynn, when were you appointed to this role as, as in your current commissionership? The beginning of 2014. Beginning of 2014. So why don't we have an existing policy in place right now? Because as I said before, um, the most important issue in the collective bargaining agreements whether it was the restoration 
of, the, uh, of those two 4% increases for the teachers and uh, another 50,000 workers who hadn't received them as well. Um, we spent many, many, many months reaching an agreement that many people said was impossible. I have to say that paid parental leave I don't think was even brought to the table um, during that period of time. Uh, the, the central issue was how we dealt with those increases, how we dealt with increases going forward, because as, as you must know that the uh, UFT settlement covered nine years. Uh, and so there was a huge issue uh, of what would be done, um, and there was the issue of how we'd provide health benefits, and that became a central issue. Um, the issue of paid parental uh, leave uh, emerged afterwards. Um, and we initially figured out a way to come up with a responsible approach for the 20,000 non-union workers um, that funded the increase uh, out of other benefits, uh, repurposed the uh, wages and benefits to do it. Um, and now it is important uh, and will be central in our negotiations. But I have to say, we've got 144 bargaining units. I'm not certain that all 144 bargaining units will see the issue the same way. Um, some will have other pr some priorities that are different from other priorities uh, and may say that we want to move forward in a different way uh, than others. And one of the things that I seek to do um, is to try to bring to the table uh, different approaches to different groups depending on what they say is critically important. I know for certain, as you expressed, that the teachers, for the teachers, this is a very, very important benefit, and I hope that we could reach an agreement with them that works for both of us. Other, other union representatives have not stated that this is central to the issue um, or for their members, and they've said their members don't have the same approach. That's why we want to tailor an approach um, to collective bargaining. That's what the Taylor Law provides. You sit down with the leadership, of the, rep of the employees and you bargain with that leadership something that works for both sides. I, I just would like to disagree with, with the statement that this is somehow a new issue. Uh, this is something that has been advocated for and pushed for a number of years by city workers, particularly educators as well. I know that for a fact, as a proud former member of, of, of the UFT and as a delegate, so this is not a new phenomena. This has been something that's been ongoing for, for, for a number of years. And again, the purpose of this hearing is not to get into the weeds. We're here discussing the public health and public impacts of not having an existing policy. Just very clearly, are you aware, uh, just it's a yes or no question, are you aware of the improvements in public health outcomes with paid parental leave? I've certainly heard reports of that. Right, it's, it's more than reports, it's, it's now becoming fact. Uh, are, are you aware that paid parental leave will help close the gender equity gap, both at work and at home? I believe paid parental leave is an important benefit and that's why we are willing to negotiate on it and then we are actively negotiating on it. Right, and are you aware that pay, the absence of paid parental leave is a major reason why a number of city workers are not staying in, in our city's uh, workforce. Have you, ha, have, are, have, you had, have you had any conversations with any agencies where they share with you this is a major concern for our workforce? I haven't had those conversations, but that's not to say that I don't believe it's an important benefit that we should achieve. Uh, the agencies with the highest percentage of female employees are those involved in education, uh, particularly in education. I, I believe over 70% uh, of, of the workforce and education department is made up of women. Healthcare or the provision of social services uh, while the agencies with the highest percentage of male employees are the uniformed agencies. Uh, can you briefly highlight which agencies you would expect to use this benefit the most and on the flip side, which agencies are less likely to take advantage of this benefit? So I don't know the answer to that. I know that we will, in negotiations, analyze the likely utilization of the benefit with the groups, uh, and that will drive our conversation about how to, uh, how to provide that benefit. So, but I don't know, I don't have, uh, th that's one of the things that in negotiations, we sit down um, and the leadership explains their interests. 
we explain our interests, and I plan to bring paid parental leave to every bargaining uh, encounter um, that we have in the uh, year to come. Uh, and uh, we will go through what the costs are and do that analysis there as part of those negotiations. I, I, I just want to state, I, I know you mentioned before in your, t in your testimony, in your response to, to Chair Drum about the negotiations uh, with the 20,000 managerial uh, positions. But to be clear, those, those folks were required to give back a raise. Is that correct? Yes, no, and that was not a negotiation. Uh, they are not. That was a yes. personnel order, forgive yes. me, yes. But they were required to give back a raise. Is that correct? They didn't give back a raise. There was a raise that had not yet been implemented, and that was not implemented for them. All right, we're going to get into semantics. No, but, 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 but they, did not, they did not lose a wage increase. There was a way that, that they had already been were receiving. Were they scheduled to receive an increase? They, they expected to receive a 0.47% increase, and that was not received. And that was scaled back? That was scaled as part of the paying for this benefit. And they also forfeited time off as well, is that correct? Those with more than 15 years of service uh, no longer accrued the 16th, the 26th and 27th day of, a, of annual leave. So remember, they still get five weeks of annual leave. They don't get five years plus one day and then five years plus two days. And so in your testimony to this committee, you mentioned that you want to review the impact of that policy which will determine the negotiations and discussions with the municipal workforce. Is that correct? I think I said that at the time we looked at it, um, we thought that repurposing the annual leave in excess of five weeks and the 0.47% increase um, that had not yet been received um, was a reasonable approach to create a benefit that many employees um, now view as a, uh, as a, as a wonderful um, and useful addition um, to the compensation package. That's what we did then. Um, we, the concept of figuring out how this benefit, first what the cost of the benefit is, and I, I really make the point again, it differs from group to group, um, but looking at the cost of the benefit and then seeing how to fit that within an economic package that is, in fact, the, uh, uh, the approach we take to the bargaining. But, Commissioner Wynn, the city actually received the benefit from this personnel order as well, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. I believe that there was a significant million, multi-million dollar net profit for the city in this, uh, no, I, I, this personnel order. Is I, that I correct? Dis I disagree. No, that's not correct. That the... Um, the actual savings didn't occur initially. Um, the 26th and 27th day occurred going forward, and the 0.47 percent um, reduction in, in uh, or, or non-implementation of the salary increase didn't occur until the year after. So ish initially, I think the numbers would demonstrate that we, the city, uh, fronted the cost of the benefit until these savings occurred. The question then is, as the savings now are in place, do those savings exceed the going forward cost of that benefit? That is something that we will take a close look at um, when we have the full year of fiscal 18, and we'll see that. But I will not concede um, that the city uh, had an advantageous uh, agreement here, an advantageous result. Um, I'm waiting to see what the results look like for fiscal 18, and then, if appropriate, we'll take another look at, uh, at the benefit package. Well, we will disagree on this point. This, when the city sees a multi-million dollar net gain, uh, the city certainly uh, can, claim a, can claim a benefit. My concern is that this issue should not be used as a bargaining chip. It should not be used as some sort of negotiation tactic where city workers are now forced to choose between supporting children, whether they're at home or supporting children at work in the classroom. This is a moral issue. This is the right thing to do. I, I note that you have mentioned that more than once today that you believe that this is a good policy. 
the purpose of this hearing is to highlight the fact that we do not have an existing policy. Right now, the existing policy for the education workforce, I, I could say, is that you have to declare a sickness to raise a family. And the term paid leave has been thrown around by city leaders, by state leaders, by national leaders. But when one closely examines their own policy, whether or not they have a paid leave policy, they don't. And so from a public impact uh, perspective, Commissioner, we're deeply concerned about this. We're very concerned about this. And the private sector is onto this. The private sector, many companies in the private sector have put in place paid parental leave policies. I cannot believe to say this on the record, but companies like Walmart or uh, Amazon others have implemented paid parental leave policies. And New York City is the progressive capital of the country and I would say the world, and we don't have one. When many city workers look at their own policies, they don't see it. And it's not a benefit. It's just not there. And many folks that I know personally, Commissioner, are facing significant financial difficulties. New teachers who are now have to pay down student debt that have to, are trying to afford to buy their first home, which is probably not going to happen. They ask me, Mr. Traeger, why am I being punished for raising a family? So I understand that everyone here, that you know, your, your position is to negotiate on behalf of the city administration. Our job is to improve public outcomes, to improve the public health, to retain quality city workers. It's actually about the kids. It's about children, the children of our workforce and the children that we serve every single day. Now, I, I, I do have some more questions, but I know some of my colleagues. Could I just make a yes, short yes, you response may. Please. to that? Uh, I first, uh, choices are made in labor negotiations all the time. The union leadership says we want to uh, apply a longevity increase, um, which applies to obviously the senior workers, doesn't apply to junior workers. Um, that's the late nature of labor negotiations, that not all benefits are across the board. Uh, parties bargain an agreement um, that makes sense for both sides, will be ratified by the members. That's what collective bargaining is, is all about. Um, I would say that uh, to say this is a bargaining chip is unfair. Um, I very much want, the administration very much wants to reach overall labor agreements, and uh, like we did, um, and like we're going to do. Uh, and so it is part of the bargaining process, that is for sure. I do want to say that when Walmart is sort of thrown up as an, an example of an employer of choice or an employer that provides uh, benefits that we want to applaud, um, we have, we should never forget, a defined compensation uh, pension plan we have health benefits paid in full that is uh, virtually uh, um, unique as far as public and private sector workers go. Um, we have an extraordinarily generous leave package that we make available to our, to our workers. Um, one, one should not lose sight of all of the important things that I'm proud of that's part of our compensation package. In a similar way, I am hoping that we can figure out a way to fit in a robust paid parental leave program as part of that package as well. Commissioner, let me tell you what's also not fair. Do you have any data with you uh, on average in the DOE, because they were supposed to be here today and they chose not to. Uh, they're a part of the equity and excellence for all movements, so they were too busy today. But do you have any data on average how many sick days men retire with versus women in the Department of Education? I do not. You do not? No. Because we're having difficulty finding that data. And I venture to guess that women in Department of Education end up having to take more, use more, and borrow more, and owe more in sick days than men do. But I could be proven right or wrong if we received that data from the administration. 
from an administration that boasts about equity and excellence for all, that boasts about closing the gender equity gap that we hear so much about, that we hear about caring for our city's workforce, we're still missing some key data and, and we still have some big concerns. And no one is suggesting that Walmart is the gold standard of treating workers, just the opposite. But we're, what we're, we are saying is that companies like Google, Amazon, and others rightfully understand that in order to attract and retain quality workers, they have to put in place a paid parental leave policy. The state of Washington is gonna have a full paid leave policy by the year 2020, where as a matter of fact, most states require their employees to, to pay in. The state of Washington is going a step further and they're going to uh, do their part to inquire, require employer, employers to pay into their policies as well. And the lower your wage, the more subsidy those folks will receive because they understand that this is a public benefit in terms of health, in terms of families, in terms of workforce. I, I want to turn now to any of my colleagues have, have any questions or be m mindful of time. Yes, we do. And I just want to say that we've been joined by Councilmember Kalos and Councilmember Barron. And uh, we have questions from Councilmember Kalos, Kumbo, Lander, Cohen, and Adams. And they will be on the clock for five minutes each. Okay, uh, Councilmember Kalos. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Do you support New York City's paid sick leave policy in the private sector? Yes. Did employee, employers subject to paid sick leave only have to comply after they negotiated with employees or they just have to give it to employees because it was the right thing to do and now the law? I don't believe, I don't believe there was a bargaining requirement there. As, as you know, uh, other than in the public sector, there are virtually there are very few labor unions. About 6% of the private sector currently is represented by labor unions. So, As so opposed to New York City, where 90 some odd percent of the workforce is covered by collective bargaining. And that's where we, where we bargain over benefits. Sure, so in your testimony you stated a little over two years ago, the city implemented paid parental leave for managers and other non-unionized employees, up to 30 work days of, of Paid parental leave once per rolling 12-month period at 100% of their regular salary. Do you believe that six weeks is enough? I believe six weeks provides an important benefit um, and we thought was a, an appropriate place to start and is, I think, where I'd like to try to start in collective bargaining. New York State offer, now offers paid family leave. They actually have already started with eight weeks. Is new, and they're going to go to 12 weeks, is, is two, 12 weeks too much? So as I understand, the state benefit provides only a percentage of salary, and it's a percentage of the average salary in the state. So I'm not sure what the state benefit would provide for many city workers who are paid substantially more than the state average. So it's, so it's again, I think you, you help emphasize the point. Um, it's a combination of both duration and amount of reimbursement. The plan that we came up with had 100% reimbursement for six weeks. Clearly an alternative would be a lower percentage of reimbursement for a longer period of time. Uh, our route was to go for six weeks of paid in full. You keep talking about collective bargaining and negotiating. What do you want from labor unions in exchange for giving them the same paid family leave you've given all the managers in the city? So first of all, I would say, uh, if I expressed what I want, I would express that to the labor negotiators at the table. What I would like to achieve for the purpose of these discussions are collective bargaining agreements, um, and that we are in the process of those discussions, uh, and I think that is in any important benefit that employees receive, um, it should not be preempted through a process that's different from collective bargaining either way. Uh, I shouldn't unilaterally make decisions. Others shouldn't unilaterally make decisions. It should be left to the mature representatives, uh, the capable representatives of labor and management to sit down and bargain agreements. Unless it's in the private sector, in which case you do support paid sick leave and the ability of institutions such as ourselves to enter into the contractual relationship of an employer and employee 
and say this is what's right. So I guess my question for you is specifically I, I, I disagree with that, though. I disagree. I believe that where you have an entire workforce that is represented by capable and able uh, leadership, that the appropriate pro a place for terms and conditions of employment by law and by good, uh, good approach to labor management relations should be at the bargaining table. Is there any type of benefit you would ever concede that you should just give it to somebody on the table without asking for anything in return? And would this rise to the level of one of those benefits? I believe that we have a responsible and robust compensation package that we should work within collective bargaining to figure out how we repurpose parts of it and how we add to it. But that, that, that it I, belie I believe, I believe, I uh, believe, as I've seen in the city from 12 years in the Koch administration and my time now um, and work that I've done in the middle, uh, that the uh, union leadership in New York City has not required assistance to be able to achieve at the bargaining table benefits that were important for their workers. They've been very, they've been How very is effective doing it. How not hypocritical to say the manager should get paid family leaves, but the employees shouldn't, and we're not gonna just give it to you because it's the right thing to do. We want something back in return. I don't understand. The hypocrisy seems to me I just totally misplaced. We said with the managers that we would repurpose the compensation package to provide a very important benefit. I think the general reaction has been that we did well in doing that. Both labor and both the workers and the employer and the public. Thank you. Councilmember Kumbo. Thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you, Chair Traeger. I just have to agree with my colleagues on so many different levels. The fact that this is something that's being bargained in 2018 is really absurd to me at this point. My question, and, and I want to go to some 101, is that in this collective bargaining um, that's happening, and the reason why it's so frustrating is because family leave is really, for so many families, a life or death situation. So like I'll give you an example. So the month after I found out that I was pregnant, my doctor said, you have to go on bed rest for three weeks at the very least. So I had to take off three weeks at the age of 43 having a baby. What is your policy or plan if a mother has a difficult pregnancy and has to um, address issues such as bed rest? How do you address those? Where, where, where would that fall in line with your policy? I think that falls within the use of sick leave, uh, and I'd say is uh, there are a lot of very difficult situations. People develop cancer, they develop all sorts of problems where they need sick leave, and I think that the city as an employer um, works very effectively with workers to try and accommodate and deal, uh, deal with that. They can borrow sick leave, they can, uh, um, they can take unpaid leave if, if necessary, but there are a series of benefit pack, uh, approaches um, that we use. Uh, for the situations of, of illness um, or difficult childbirth. But I, I do believe that in a, in a country where people are diminishing collective bargaining, left and right, mm -hmm. where states eliminate the ability of employees to bargain at the table, that we should never forget how different we are in New York City how we approach collective bargaining as, as a central principle of the way labor and management should work together. And to the extent that I say to the, to come to, come to here and say, these are central issues for consideration, shouldn't be denigrated, it should be celebrated. I agree with you in what you're saying, and I believe that Collective bargaining is a powerful tool, but there are some things that should just be fundamental and baseline. And I think that that's where we're having the issue is that um, going on bed rest, having a child, recovering, it's not a sickness. You as an, as an adult have a responsibility to deliver into the world the most vulnerable entity in the world, life. This life has 
no other dependent, it, you are completely dependent to bring this child forward in the most healthy way possible. And in your mind as a mother, you should never have to think about, I'll just go in this one day, even though, because I can't afford this time off now, because after I have the child, I'm gonna have to take off additional time. You should never, I thank God actually, now that I'm hearing what you're saying, that I have this job, because this job allowed me the opportunity to just take off. And to be honest with you, if they had said you have to take off the whole nine months, I would have just done that because there's nothing more important than bringing your healthy child. And I don't know what that would have rendered me in terms of my life or my, or my work or my career. But through this collective bargaining, is it that, and give me a 101 because I don't understand it exactly, would it mean that different entities or, or unions that you're meeting with could come out with a, a, a whole plethora of different types of paid family leaves? Or is it that if you accept this one, is there just one type of 12 week, it's paid, if you bargain with us, this is the whole package? Or could someone say, we'll do eight weeks, uh, we'll do four weeks, we think two weeks is, is what should happen here. Could everybody come away with some sort of all across the board of what they're going to offer? Or is there one thing, one package that you're bargaining with? No, we are. The, under the law, we bargain with 144 different unions, um, and they bring issues to the table uh, that is not, doesn't provide for a central benefit. Uh, and uh, it doesn't make the process uh, easy. Uh, it makes the process complex. But each union has a right to bargain over any term and condition of employment separately. Uh, and my hope is that we do not have 144 different approaches. But you could. You conceivably could. See, that's, that's the, highly that's problematic because there are some unions that are going to be, and I'm not, you know, men, I love you, but there could be some where they're more male-dominated, where they may have other things as their priority that's at the top of their agenda, whereas they could have 2% of their workforce, like some of our agencies, and that's just not at the top of their thought, and whoever everybody is that's coming to the table, that's not what's in their mind to bargain with you. So in a process like this, if you don't have women at the table, except for in the city council, because as you can see, our male counterparts here are even more enthusiastic than some of the women at times about issues related to equity in women, which is wonderful, but that's not going to be the reality for each of these 144 different entities that you're coming to the table with. This is where the problem lies. You have to come in with this at a foundational baseline that this is what we want and anything else is unacceptable because you'll have 144 different programs based off of who likes what or who they're representing or what they're pushing or what their goals and agendas are. So let me say this. Uh the law requires approaching each of the unions on the issues they bring to the table if it's a mandatory subject of bargaining, as this would be. That's not to say the city doesn't bring to the table uh, a view as well as to what should be part of the package. Uh, and I can assure you uh, that paid parental leave has been part of our concept of what needs to come out of this bargaining round with every group we've sat down with. But you did say under your testimony that it seemed to have been an afterthought for many of the union heads that you were speaking to, and that for some, this didn't even come up. No, I didn't say it was an afterthought. I said in the last round of bargaining, I'm not certain. Now, I got here in the middle of the last round, I'm talking about the one that ended nine years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe in that round of bargaining there were proposals on paid parental leave. Um, in the, uh, I, I, I arrived with an two arbitrations, one involving nurses um, and uh, uh, one involving 1199 healthcare workers, and then the teachers, which was a fact finding. I don't believe that this issue was before the, before the parties at that point. That's all I say. I think I that if we don't- leader, I just need you to wrap yes. up. I just want to close by just saying, I, I think that if we continue to utilize this, as you don't believe, but I believe from what I'm hearing, if we continue to use this as a bargaining chip, it really undermines the value of children and it undermines the health and safety, particularly of women, as well as children and families altogether. This should be baselined and we, there should be no way that this is approached, that this could be bargained in a way that some agencies will come out with one plan and others won't. And I'll just conclude on that and turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have been joined by council members Rodriguez and Levine. And now we're going to go to questions from council member Lander followed by Cohen. 
Thank you, Chair Drum. Chair Drum, excuse me. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, for being here. And and I do appreciate uh, the position that you're in. And I want you to bargain on behalf of the people of New York to make sure you get the best deal you can. And I appreciate that you're right in the first round of bargaining uh, that you did over the past four years. You delivered a set of things that people thought would be very challenging to deliver. So I do appreciate that. Um, and I also I just appreciate there's a real tension here because what our sense of the minimum basic standard that every worker's got to get evolves over time. And I guess I want to ask you about something that that was happening on last cycle and how you dealt with it. Um, you know, when we started last term, you had many city workers, unfortunately, making less than $10 an hour. And we collectively decided as a city, in law, in the private sector, in law, and what we contracted, that that wasn't okay. That the minimum standard was that we wanted to get every worker to 15 bucks an hour um, on a set of steps over time. And obviously, that had to cover municipal workers as well. We were hypocrites to say, if you're a city contractor, you got to get to 15, and then we're going to get everyone on a path to 15, but we don't have our workers on a path to 15. So. I guess I'd just like to ask in that situation, um, how did you view on the one hand the sense of an evolving minimum standard that every single worker needs to have with your bargaining responsibilities in dealing with units who represented workers who didn't have it? So let me uh, back up first to a comment you made about sort of my view is, is achieving the best deal possible. Um, I don't view that as my objective. My objective is to find a fair and responsible settlement. Um, and I, I think that's very different and perhaps very different from what you hear at the national level now in conversation about what, what deals should be like. And uh, uh, I don't view that it is a transactional conversation that is one and done. Um, I believe you're establishing long-term relationships um, and that you uh, have responsibilities to the public, to the workers, uh, to, the, to the taxpayer. All of those are responsibilities that need to be balanced to be, and that's why you want to re re reach a responsible settlement. Um, as to the minimum wage, um, in fact, it had very minimal increase uh, impact on us because of the collective bargaining increases that we negotiated. Um, and that, in fact, uh, a handful of the 360,000, now 380,000 workers, um, were affected by, uh, by that. And uh, um, we did decide, though, that where there were a, ha a handful of workers um, during the course of the contract that would not reach those minimums, we would move them along to, to reach those minimums. And all I would say is that I think what we're having, you know, while you're bargaining, in the ways that you just outlined, which is obviously important and appropriate, there's an evolving set of what the minimum acceptable standards for all workers to have. Um, and last cycle, part of that was making sure that we got all workers to 15 bucks an hour. Um, and that was because we had a collective sense as a city that that's a basic minimum standard that everybody's got to have, and therefore you had to factor it into your bargaining. And I think you hear it's very clear that the council feels like paid parental leave is becoming an important part of the basic minimum standard that all workers need to have. And I appreciate that it's a challenge for you to think through how to implement that at the bargaining table with different workers who will put it at different places in their uh, priority list, as Councilmember Cumbo said, and who have other issues that are important and that you've got to go through a complex negotiation. But I think what we just want to be clear about is just like last cycle, we felt it was critical that every worker earned at least 15 bucks an hour, that every worker has got to get paid parental leave. And fair enough that you have to figure out how to implement that in the context of those contracts uh, in collective bargaining, which I respect, and I really respect your ability to do it. Um, but it is an evolving standard, and it's one that we want all workers to have in the public and private sector. Um, across every bargaining unit, those that don't have a bargaining unit, and we've got to lead the way. So that's a, that's a challenge you're going to face, no doubt, but um, you know, so, I just so, want yeah. to associate myself with so, the so, of my and, colleagues and, and that feel not only is it a priority or a goal, it's an evolving basic minimum standard that we got to get for every worker. So my answer there would be just as the approach to the salaries occurred um, after most of the city collective bargaining contracts were in place. Um, that a lot will occur in the next several months in our bargain. And I would uh, respectfully request that everyone see what happens there, see if we've achieved something that is consistent um, with the objectives that you're setting, and then see what, we, what needs to be done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Cohen, followed by Adams, and then Levin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, I, I'm just going to focus on it. I, I mean, I, you, you get the sentiment, I think, that we all seem to be pretty much on the same page here. Your testimony was, though, that the law requires that this be collectively bargained. Are there, other, are there things for organized workers that you don't have to collectively bargain with? Could, I mean, could you, by, could the mayor, by stroke of pen, give this benefit if he wanted to? So under the Taylor Law, um, there are elements that are prohibited, namely pensions. Uh, and the pensions, you can't reach a pension agreement uh, per se. And so that is done, uh, the law is provided for uh, decades now, um, that that is not a subject of bargaining uh, at, uh, appropriately before the table, at the, at the bargaining table. Um, there are issues that are non-mandatory subject of bargaining. Um, that are generally not, ec not wage issues, uh, um, not specific benefit issues. They may be issues in terms of um, how, you, uh, uh, how you make managerial decisions of, of, some, of some sort. Um, those that are terms and conditions of employment under the law, wages and hours and, uh, and benefits, um, those are mandatory subjects of bargaining. And those, if one party wants to bargain over it, the other party must bargain over it. Um, and that's what the law provides. Um, it's provided that since uh, uh, the 1960s, um, both at the city collective bargaining law and, and the Taylor law at the state level. So, so you couldn't give a bonus? Uh, uh, if the city wanted to give a bonus, they could not give it? Absolutely a bonus. not. Absolutely. That is a mandatory subject of bargaining. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you. Councilmember Adams. Thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, uh, like several of my colleagues, I too uh, come from an education background and I can tell you that uh, as one who has been a caretaker uh, in daycare for quite a while, having, having a six-week-old infant leave, leave their mother or leave their parent so soon after birth is a very, very difficult thing uh, to have. Uh, even though as educators we do what we have to do in the interest of our children. I have to also echo the sentiments of uh, Chair Traeger and uh, the Majority Leader in that this discussion around collective bargaining is most disturbing to hear that we are looking at children and looking at mothers and looking at parents as items to be bargained with uh, in the year 2018. Um, I consider this to be a moral issue, and uh, it, it's just very disturbing to hear that we have to bargain this issue uh, and, and this policy, which should be a common sense baseline policy at this point in time. So I don't know if you can answer this question, but you have told us that there have been some negotiations in progress around this issue. Are you getting a sense that you will have a lot of resistance to the agreements of this policy being permanent? No, I'm not. I believe that we will be re reaching agreements uh, on this issue um, with the workforce. Uh, and that though we've just begun that process, with, but with, we've been speaking to a number of the large unions, so I believe that we will, we will effectively do this. I do have to say, though, in terms of the importance of a benefit, um, I believe uh, that health care is an extraordinarily important benefit, issues of life and death. Uh, and I don't, so I don't see that, uh, and that is clearly part of collective bargaining, um, and clearly I think we all concede that, that that must be at the bargaining table. Um, I believe those are very important, life and death, family issues uh, that are, are tremendously important, uh, and it's part of what we are charged with um, in, in, in our bargaining. Uh, and, I, and I'd have to say, as I uh, said to the majority leader before, I believe the fact that we are so willing to engage in problem-solving collective bargaining um, is something that we should all be very proud of in New York City, and it is an issue that then the paid parental leave is front and center in those conversations. I would agree with you. Uh, with that sentiment very much so. I would also, um, and just to close with this, that the language perhaps should be adjusted because as uh, Chair Traeger expressed, to consider 
uh, parental leave as an illness or having a child as an illness uh, in the year 2018 it just seems <coughs> very archaic. Um, particularly to myself and several members of this body. Thank you very much for your testimony. You're welcome. I also Hi. do not consider my three grandchildren to be illnesses. <laughs> Council Member Levin. Thank you very much, Chair Drum. Um, so I want to thank uh, my colleague, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, for this legislation. I want to thank uh, Chair Drum for advancing it, uh, as well as, uh, as uh, Chair Traeger um, and, uh, and, and, and the Speaker. Um, so Mr. Lynn, I I'm at a loss. I'm at a loss. We went through a whole um, public announcement with the mayor. I was there at DC 37. We talked about paid parental leave for every city employee. I walked away from that announcement under the impression that every city employee was entitled to paid parental leave. Um, so to find out that uh, our unionized workforce does not have this paid parental leave that I took advantage of, mm -hmm. that my colleague took advantage of, that every member that works, that uh, anybody that works uh, in a managerial position has access to, uh, anybody that works for the mayor's office has access to, my employees have access to, anybody that works for the council has access to. And for our unionized workforce in New York City to not have access to that, is, is an outrage, it's an outrage. And we should not allow for that to happen. So my question is, is there any reason why paid parental leave is not taken off the table for negotiations with unions and say, you know what, this is something we're not even gonna, we're gonna, this is, this is we're gonna start off mm -hmm. negotiations by saying, you can have this because you're entitled to this because you're a city worker and you're entitled in 2018 to paid parental leave, you don't even have to negotiate. Is there anything that stops the city from saying, this isn't even a point of negotiation, you can have it? So first of all, I'm not certain why you didn't understand the extent of the benefit, I think, from the very first words uh, of the announcement of the uh, paid parental leave, we made clear um, that since it was a mandatory subject of bargaining, it was only covered those for those workers who were not covered by collective bargaining. And I think we used at the time the 20,000 workers, um, and it shouldn't have been confusing uh, that when we had 380,000 workers, um, if we said it covered 20,000, uh, that meant uh, 340 or 360,000 was not covered by that order. So I, I, thought, I, think, I thought because I, we were having I, this big announcement I, that it was applying to everybody, especially I, at a the largest municipal labor union. So, so I uh, thought, and actually I think the announcement was not done at DC 37, it wasn't done at DC 37, it was done downstairs here, um, where we were very clear um, in terms of the, I, I participated in that, and I thought we were very clear of who was covered and who was not, and I specifically do not think it was done at DC 37, so since we weren't, we, had, we it was not part of negotiations with them. I thought that was the minimum, that was the, the $15 an hour. Yes, yes. Say. Okay. So, we clarified that. Um, I believe a benefit that potentially of citywide cost of hundreds of millions per year, billion dollars over a financial plan, can be both very important, critically important, and I concede how important the benefit is, but still should be part of a thoughtful economic analysis of what, the, of what the overall compensation package looks like. And that is what we have said, and at the time, the, when the mayor announced the benefit, he said, this is a benefit that we believe is paid for for these 20,000 workers, combination of the change of the annual leave and the, uh, the elimination of an upcoming 0.47% wage increase. Um, and we said, the mayor said at the time that we would like to come to the bargaining table with the groups and figure out how to do something like this uh, for others. And that's what we're now doing. And we're, having, and we're having these discussions, and it is my hope that we'll be successful. Are we requiring it of, of private sector these days? Does the private sector have to do paid parental leave? Does the private sector, some, some does, uh, some doesn't. Well, most, most do not in the private, uh, private sector. Some, some, some employers do. Do you believe that paid parental leave is a, is a right? No, I believe it is a benefit that should be part of a compensation package 
Um, much as I would say, do I believe the health benefits? I believe health benefits should be part of a compensation package. But health benefits are not a right. Health benefits in New York City, in New York City. Health employees. insurance is not a human health right. Health insurance is a mandatory subject of bargaining under the city collective bargaining law and the Taylor law. That's what the law provides. And I am happy and proud to be at the table bargaining over that benefit. So, so the message I'm getting from you is, according to the city of New York, the de Blasio administration, health care is not a human right. And and uh, paid parental leave is not a right. I believe that's such a terrible mischaracterization of what I said. No, no, you said that, that there, you the, said the topic, that's not the a topic, the t these but, are but, both, excuse these, me, can I please finish? These are both mandatory subjects of bargaining under the law, and that is the forum for the discussions in terms of what the law provides for collective bargaining. And I said, I'm not sure you were here at the time. I said that the fact that we so willingly engage in collective bargaining we so moved from zero workers covered by collective bargaining to 99.9% .9 of the workers. That demonstrates how we are willing to bargain collectively and collaboratively. And this is a topic, both health and the uh, uh, paid parental leave, that is front and center in our labor negotiations. But, but in order to bar, is there, there's nothing that prevents you from saying this is at, as, at an initial offer that it is going to come at no at no expense to the rest of the bargaining on the rest of the contract. I believe there's nothing that prevents you from I, doing that. I believe that the because that would excuse me. I sir, believe that would comport to the, that would comport if you were to believe that it's a right. If you were to believe that that paid parental leave is a right, then you should offer it at the outset without any without without having to bargain for it. Collective bargaining, okay, but 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 it should be it should be on the table at the outset, not subject to negotiation. The Taylor Law provides that terms and conditions of employment must be negotiated. This is one of them. So you do not believe, do you believe that, that, that paid parental leave is a right? I believe it's a mandatory subject of bargaining and the appropriate forum for discussion is at the collective bargaining table. But Council there's nothing that prevents Council you from, from offering that out up front, not subject to negotiation, but as, a, as an initial offer. I think you've heard my response. Okay. Thank Mr. You. Chair. I, I want to say clearly here on the record, health care is a right, paid parental leave is a right, we should be leading by example with our city's workforce and not, and not, uh, and not, not uh, parsing it out the way that we are right now. I would like to say this. I think that by having come to the city and participated in reaching collective bargaining agreements with all of the city workers over issues that were of critical importance to both labor and management and doing it in a responsible way, that is what we stand for in this administration. But people should not have and to negotiate will, their okay, paid parental leave against their pensions. They should not pay, have to negotiate their paid parental leave against their Seven, pensions. They shouldn't have to negotiate it against their other sick time. They should, they should be a right codified into law, codified into every contract at the outset, not negotiated away. Thank you. Councilmember Levine. Thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Traeger, and thank you uh, very much to our majority leader uh, for putting this important resolution forward. Uh, I believe that the money we spend on this should be seen as an investment, not an expense. Um, my understanding it is that it would represent a very small percentage of the total budget of the city, which I'll remind you is now $89 billion as proposed by the mayor in his executive budget. Um, this, I'm sure, would be much, much less than 1% of that, probably less than a half or a third of a percent of that. And uh, my colleague has spoken very eloquently about why this is a valuable investment in the lives of the next generation of New Yorkers, of babies who are born, who, for whom there's no substitute to have the presence of a parent in the critical early weeks of their life, uh, their scientific data to back up just how influential that can be in their later development. But all of us, I think, know in our own lives, if we're lucky to have children, um, we've seen how powerful that is, and we would want that for every child. But I also think this is an investment that yields benefits for the city, um, particularly if you think about um, a profession like teaching. Uh, I started my career as a teacher. Um, it's a very difficult job. We are facing real challenges in retaining talented teachers. And uh, I think one of the reasons is that so many of them come to us in their early 20s and are later going to become parents, and that this is a diffi difficult career to manage for those 
uh, in their childbearing years. And to offer uh, paid family leave, something we should have done uh, generations ago, uh, won't just benefit the babies that are born in the city, but I think will help us to ease the stress of very difficult jobs in city government, the stress of people who are in the classroom, um, one of the most difficult jobs in our society, and will help us retain great city workers and great teachers who need this in order to manage their difficult lives, uh, their lives at work and their lives at home. So uh, this, this is an investment worth making uh, and one that I think is, is eminently affordable. Have you uh, begun to assess what you think the scale of this investment would be if, if rolled out to the entire workforce? So that's uh, something I answered before, oh, um, and uh, I said that if the cost is a roughly six-tenths of a percent, uh, which is what we thought, 6.65 percent, but we thought it with managers, um, that would scaled out to the entire workforce, be about $250 million a year, a billion dollars over the financial plan. Um, but that is the very topic that we now have, the very discussions we now have with the, with the unions uh, representing the workers, which is assessing what is the cost of the benefit, how we can most effectively implement it, um, not unilaterally deciding that it should be done only one way, but to work with the, labor, with the labor leaders to figure out what can be tailored and appropriately done for the workforce they represent. Um, and those negotiations are ongoing. Uh, and uh, um, as I said earlier, I think that it would be uh, worthwhile to see whether the collective pro bargaining process does indeed deliver um, solutions to these complex problems. That is what collective bargaining does at its best. Uh, and I, I hear you on that. Just, just so that I, I uh, don't, don't lose the rest of my time, I want, I, I, I want to emphasize that even if we were to accept the, the full value as you have estimated, uh, relative to what will probably be a $400 billion total budget over the period of the contract. This is a very, very, very small percentage and eminently affordable, but I also think you need to account for the benefit to the city of retaining great talent among our public sector workers, of retaining great teachers in the classroom, and, um, and that has value. Uh, it actually costs us money when we lose good people. And so I would implore you in considering um, the financial impact of this policy to account for that, to not look at this as simply uh, a short-term cost in covering, during, covering the expense of the leave, but to look also at the benefit of providing, um, making it easier for great public employees to continue to work in this city. So let me say this, um, issues of recruitment and retention are central to the considerations that we deal with every day. Um, and figuring out solutions to those problems, uh, my first deputy regularly deals with on an hourly basis, if not daily basis. Um, that's part of what we do. Uh, and I think that uh, it would be uh, inappropriate to conclude that the issues that everyone around the table raised are not part of our collective bargaining. But I think it also would be inappropriate to not celebrate that that is what collective bargaining in New York is about, and that's what we're doing. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Traver, Traeger. Yeah, I just uh, want to respond to a couple of things I've heard, and just to kind of summarize, I know that we have uh, additional folks waiting to, to testify. I just want to be very clear. Raising a family is not a new phenomenon. I keep hearing that this is sort of, you know, the new baseline need of the 21st century. No, folks, uh, you know, raising family has, this is, goes back to the beginning days of civilization. Um, the needs of a newborn child are not a new phenomena. The need for mom and dad or two parents to spend time with their newborn is not a new phenomena. What's new is that with all the announcements about paid leave, a lot of folks are closely, more closely examining their own existing policies, realizing there is none. Just want to be very clear, because when the state announces, announced that it had its statewide uh, paid leave policy, it applied to the private sectors giving municipalities the power to opt in. 
which this municipality has not opted in. So 91% of our city's workforce wakes up the morning after these announcements and realizes that all of these policies don't extend to them. I also just want to say, respectfully, Commissioner Lynn, reaching labor deals with unions in an era of having large reserves shows how low the bar is because the Bloomberg administration simply abdicated its responsibility to strike responsible deal deals during its time. I know that because I was a city teacher during the Bloomberg years. And they failed to come to the table time and time again to discuss any responsible negotiation. So the city of New York has had to play a game of catch up in terms of fairness and equity and justice with its workforce because of just decades and so many years of outright neglect of our city's labor force and families. So yes, I commend the fact that we have struck deals with labor unions since this administration took over, but I'm just pointing out to you, sir, how low the bar is to say that yes, we struck a deal, but the fact remains that this should not be used as a bargaining chip. This should not be used as a negotiation tactic. There is a real serious public health impact in the absence of a fair and just paid parental leave policy. There's a real impact in terms of gender equity, in terms of retaining quality city workers. That's what this is about. So I just want to tell my colleagues that other states and other cities and other companies are moving forward faster than New York on this issue because they understand that they want to retain the best and support the best. And I also just want to say, when my colleagues and I talk about this issue of a bargaining chip, what that means is that when we say we want a family to spend time with their newborn, we want them to also be able to afford to support their newborn. Because the Federal Medical Leave Act gives folks, yes, 12 weeks of unpaid leave, which only applies to about 60% of the country, by the way. The State Family Leave Act applies to the private sectors with giving the cities the option to opt in, which the city has not opted in. So it does not apply to the majority of our city workforce. So first and foremost, we have an obligation to be honest about what we're dealing with here. And so I urge this administration to negotiate in good faith with our labor unions, with the understanding that there is a significant public health positive impact with having this policy in place. You refer to it as a benefit. I believe this is about moral justice and fairness and basic decency for families in New York, that we are the the, the progressive beacon, a city that welcomes and celebrates all, that we are not just saying equity and excellence for all as a slogan, but it is an applied practice. That's what I'd like for us to close this hearing about. And Commissioner, I appreciate you coming here today. I still do not appreciate the fact that the Department of Education chose not to show up here today. Can I make can I just one, one response? Please. Because I, I do appreciate the give and take that we've had. Uh, I do want to point out that the opt-in under the state law is where there's unions, th it's through collective bargaining. It's not that the city unilaterally decides, but through collective bargaining. You do have the commitment uh, of the city, the administration, and of me, that we will in good faith bring to the table the issues and concerns you raised um, that we share, uh, and that we think this is an important part of what city workers should have. And so uh, we are there. We're, I'm with you in, the, in good faith. We need to discuss this at the table, and we are doing that. Thank you. And I want to say we've been joined by Councilmember Cornegy and Williams, and we have two follow-up questions. I'm going to allot three minutes' time each. Uh, Chair, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo, followed by uh, Councilmember Levin. I just wanted to make a brief point. Uh, when I address the issue of bed rest, I received what you said, but when I thought about it afterwards, it, it still got to the heart of the matter. When I was told to go on bed rest, I wasn't actually sick. I felt fine, 
but the issue was that my pregnancy would be further complicated if I continued to go to work on a day in and day out basis. So again, I really just want to continue to hammer away at the point that family leave is not an issue of um, sickness. It is a natural part of life that is almost, no, it is inevitable in order for us to create future generations of people. So I would continue to hammer away at the point that paid family leave should never be confused with sickness. And we need to just continue to rethink how we approach bringing a child into the world. So I just wanted to bring that point home and turn it back over to my colleague because many members have joined us, but we have to end this cycle of seeing it as a sickness. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Thank you very much. Um, so, Mr. Lynn, by the way, you were, you were right. It was, I, I had my, my announcements mixed up. The one at DC 37 was around the $15 an hour. This, this one, so I stand corrected. Um, question, follow-up question. Um, which union contracts has this administration negotiated that do include paid parental leave? So far, we've not had any, but the contracts are, simple, are ending now. So we are in active negotiations. About 40% of the workforce or more have now expired. Um, and how, many, how many contracts has this administration negotiated? 144. And of those 144, how many have included I paid think parental that leave? You have, I think you were not here as part of the earlier conversation not. we had, where I said that we came to the city with 100% of the workers without labor agreements. I, and I appreciate I give you and credit for that. in those negotiations, I don't recall the issue of paid parental leave as being a proposal from any of the unions, any of the 144, during that term. Now it is an important issue, and part spurred by the city's own move with its non-represented workers to implement paid parental leave. And it now is a subject with two major unions uh, who are now currently at the table. How many union contracts have been negotiated since the since the, the mayor made the announcement in 2016? Uh, none for the new, peri the new labor period. So uh, all the contracts were negotiated prior all to All those time. covered the 2000, uh, from 2008 to 2017. Okay. Those were the group that were, the 144 contracts that we reached covered that, and that has, and this issue was not part of any of those negotiations, and that not raised by the labor leaders. Never. Uh, as a proposal. Not, not so far. No, no, since we've now reached agreements, um, and as new as these agreements currently expire, they are at the table. And we are, in fact, in good faith, sitting down and talking about these issues. And they're being negotiated against what other issues? They are being part of the overall labor negotiations. Uh, and it is my hope that when we reach a resolution of the overall labor agreement, it will include this benefit. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I just want to reiterate, uh, paid parental leave is a right. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Levin. And just finally, uh, uh, Councilmember uh, Germani Williams. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the hearing, um, and thank you for being here. It was just uh, a comment. Um, I've, I've had reason to be traveling across the state recently, um, and this is an issue uh, that I bring up. Um, I always point out I'm always concerned uh, when the governor does things, and so he always puts uh, some mirrors to make it look bigger. Uh, than it is when you take the mirrors away, you find it's not as good as it should have been. And this is one of those issues. Uh, he allowed people to opt out in a way that he should have. Uh, he celebrated a, a parental leave uh, that wasn't as big as it should have been, whether it's us, whether it's SUNY. There are people who now don't have um, these protections for no other reason except that he just allowed it uh, to opt out. So I'm glad that we had this hearing today. I just wanted to make sure I was able uh, to put that on the record uh, for many reasons. So thank you for being here, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, and uh, thank you to the Office of Labor Relations. We look forward to continuing the discussion with you as we move down the road. I'd now like to call Michael Mogru, the President of the United Federation of Teachers, Jessica Jean Marie, I believe, from the United Federation of Teachers, uh, Emily James, UFT, and Carolyn Duggan uh, from the UFT as well.
Hey, President Mulgrew, good to see you. It's nice to see you, Chairman. And uh, uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, first I want to thank uh, both of the chairs, uh, Chairman Traeger and Chairman Drum, thank you so much for having this hearing. And of course, Majority Leader Cumbo, thank you so much. I am joined here today by Carolyn Dugan, uh, a teacher from Manhattan, uh, Jessica Jean Marie, and Eric Ruben per Perez. So after listening to the commissioner's testimony, it has changed my testimony quite a bit. Two years ago, was one of the happiest days of the UFT when a mayor said he was doing paid parental leave and he wanted all city workforce to be able to have access to it and he had opened the doors and said come on in to negotiate. Uh, my union had been fighting for 55 years and for the last three rounds of bargaining this was a demand that we were talking about. Um, so here we are now 57 years later and not a single city worker who is uh, represented by a union has paid parental leave. So what has happened and why is this an issue? Well, first of all, when the mayor made the announcement, he never said it's subject to the next round of collective bargaining. I want to be clear with all of you because many of your questions surround, were surrounding collective bargaining. The municipality has a right to come to an agreement on any issue at any time in terms of the collective bargaining process. When it became clear to us, when we did the analysis of the announcement that was made, that the city was actually making money off of the city, worker, the city workers who were not represented by a union, we pointed that out to them. We said, we are very interested in doing paid parental leave, but we are not interested in it be being a revenue source for the city of New York. We believe that is immoral. If you take, and of course, there was a lot of argument around that, and then we were happy to see Two years later, the IBO came out with its report, shockingly to us, backing up exactly what we had showed the city. Now, the commissioner can try to dance around that issue all that he wants. This is very simple. When you do any sort of bargaining, you have what is called a costing sheet. Everything has a dollar amount connected to it. We know what the managerial employees of the city of New York gave up, exactly what the costing was, and we know what the benefit was paid out. So we know that the city made $8.5 million in its first year on its paid parental leave policy. If you extrapolate from 20,000 workers to 380,000 workers, that benefit, people, unionized city workers, would be a revenue source of over $110 million a year to the city of New York. Well, there goes the morality argument right out the window at that moment, doesn't it? So I do believe now as we are more towards the next round of bargaining, some unions have already started. As many of my members have said to me, the medical condition known as a pregnancy, if the mayor, the commissioner, and some other, lab, uh, un some other city officials were to experience it, you really wouldn't have much of an issue at the bargaining table anymore. I believe this is clearly gender bias on behalf of the city of New York. And I do believe now it is being used completely as a bargaining chip against our union, the union with the highest female density. So I am quite aggravated and pissed off with the city on this whole thing. Right now, the current robust package on maternity leave, as the commissioner spoke to you, not one thing in it was ever given to us or agreed upon by the city of New York. All of the, our maternity leave policies right now were mandated by the federal government. So the city of New York has never given anyone, any of its workers, any sort of rights unless it was mandated through federal authority. I want to be very clear, and the current conditions that we have to deal with are disgusting. The fact that our members have to use up or save all the sick time they possibly can and then borrow it just so they can have a child. If this was happening to a male workforce, this would not have continued. Let's just say what it is. So, I look now across the entire country. 
I see more and more cities adopting paid parental leave policies. Some we are fine with, some would be the common ones we would always think about, San Francisco, Seattle. But when we start talking about Kansas City, Missouri, Ferndale, Michigan, giving paid parental leave to its city workers, then I don't want to sit here and play a part of this little game that we're having right now between us and the city. I cannot be clearer. They are using this as a bargaining chip against a majority female union on purpose. It is a strategic decision. The city is angry with us because we pointed out to them that we will not be part of an agreement that allows the city to treat having a child as a revenue source for the city. Now, in terms of everyone's morality that we hear a lot about on this issue, we are quite upset when the city makes speeches and pronouncements about their paid parental leave and how they have done this. It is the height of hypocrisy. If they are so worried as they say they go to work with us on any one and any of their conditions, I will bring to you the case of Jillian Rivera. She had her child. After 25 weeks, the child was two pounds. She had her child and had to get back to work ASAP because she knew she was going to need all of her sick days and borrow time the minute the child came home because of the severe illnesses that he faced. This is her son when he was born. She went to work every single day to save her time so that she knew her, what her responsibilities were going to be. When her child finally came home, the city said, since you already had your child and you went back to work, we're denying your right to leave. So much for the high horse on that side. And she had to drop off a payroll to take care of her child, and she literally was able to survive by a tax return at the end. So in terms of the city's pronouncement here that everything has to be done through collective bargaining, I agree. But collective bargaining does not require us to tie a bunch of other things to it. The city absolutely has a right to come in, sit down at the table, and tell us we believe this is important on behalf of the city of New York. It, we believe this is part of our value system. And we want to know what we can do to make sure paid parental leave is available to everyone right now. And they could do that, and we would agree with them. But instead, we've had two years of games. Now it's all about the next round of collective bargaining. And I will say to you again, it is not a coincidence that the union that went in first to try to negotiate this was the UFT because of our population. But it is also not a coincidence that the one union the city doesn't want to deal with on this issue is the UFT because it is a bargaining chip for them. So when it comes to collective bargaining, of course, I am a strong believer of it. But I also know that the other side that management has the right to, has the ability to manipulate and be very strategic and do really bad things to workers. I appreciated the last round of bargaining on behalf of the city, but I am not happy going into this one because it is clear to me that they are setting this up. On behalf of the UFT members, I appreciate City Council having this hearing. I will tell you that Jillian and her son had a happy ending last Christmas. But what did she have to do to get to this happy ending? What? What? Huge challenges did she have to overcome in this great progressive city? What did she have to do and the sacrifices she had to make? And she told me she made these sacrifices gladly, but I think we should be doing better as a city. I would now like to ask uh, Carolyn Dugan, a teacher from Manhattan, to just, I think you should hear about what happens right now from the members themselves, and I appreciate you once again having this hearing. Thank you. My name is Carolyn Dugan, and I'm a special education teacher in Manhattan at PSIS. Pull that mic a little bit more in front of you. Right. 
My name is Carolyn Dugan, and I'm a special education teacher at PSIS 180 in Manhattan. I'm here today to advocate paid parental leave in New York City for New York City educators and all city employees. I'm here speaking out today because I don't want what happened to me to happen to any other parents. Two years ago, I gave birth to my younger daughter, Daphne. I went to labor at work because I was trying to save all my sick days for my maternity leave. I wanted to maximize the little time I had with my newborn, so instead of taking a few days before the baby was born, I worked up literally to the very last moment, and I ended up going into labor at work. I was in labor at school in the morning, and then that night I gave birth to my daughter Daphne. Up until that last day, I was commuting to work via Long Island Railroad in the subway, which as you know is not always the easiest commutes, let alone for a nine-month pregnant woman. <laughs> at work during my pregnancy, I spent most of the day on my feet teaching, up and down stairs all day long to work with different students all across the building. And as I did this, I was also combating never-ending morning sickness, yet taking a day off was never an option for me because I needed to save my days so I could use them after I had my baby. As crazy as this all sounds, it's not unusual. Teachers go into labor at school because they're hoarding their sick days. I was saving my sick days because of the antiquated maternity leave policy that the Department of Education uses. The current maternity leave policy is that if you want to remain on payroll, you have to save your sick days and use them as your maternity leave, paying it yourself with your own sick days. I had used up all my sick days with, my, with the birth of my first child, Penelope. So for the birth of my second child, Daphne, I had to borrow sick days from the Department of Education, which I'll have to pay back. Two years later, my sick day balance is negative 17. Even after borrowing days, it was not enough to stay out, of, to stay out for the re recommended eight weeks after my C-section. So I returned to the classroom after seven weeks because I could not afford to go off of payroll. I was still in pain from surgery and was operating on sometimes a total of two hours combined sleep because as you know, babies don't know the difference between day and night. At school, I was up and down stairs all day long again, on my feet for most of the day, except for during lunch. But as I ate my lunch, I was also pumping my breast milk to leave for the person who was taking care of my baby while I was at work. The most difficult part of all this was leaving my nine pound, seven week old baby to go to work because I would not be paid if I stayed home. We're educators caring for children all day, but we're not afforded the ability to stay home and take care of our own children. We're being forced to choose between our children at school and our children at home. It's time for New York City to provide paid parental leave to members of the UFT and other city employees. Thank you for letting me speak. I'm a little sick, but have no sick days left, so. Um, good afternoon, my name is Jessica Jean Marie, and I've been teaching with the DOE for nine years. I'm a dean at Harvest Collegiate High School, as well as a special education teacher. I choose to tell my story, not because there's anything extenuating or extraordinary about it. On the contrary, my story is the most average and ordinary story of those who have sought and taken maternity leave. I choose to tell my story to give voice to the thousands of us who have taken maternity leave at a financial risk the thousands of us who couldn't afford to stay out and return to work after a short six weeks, the thousands of us who aren't women but desperately want to be home to, bond, to bond with our children, and simply the thousands of us that need, to take, to, need time to take care of our family, whether it be parent or child. It is through this lens that I hope to connect with you and express how many of us there are and why parental leave is so desperately needed for teachers. Last week, I returned from maternity leave after 11 weeks from having with my child. I tried working up until I went into labor so that I could have a full 12 weeks at home with my son. Six of those weeks would go unpaid. I couldn't do it. The physical pain and the mental stress became too much. As you know, teenagers are in constant movement and have a lot of energy. Trying to do dean work while nine months pregnant put me in constant danger. From the students running around in the hallways and one nearly knocking me over, to the elevator going out of service and having to climb up to the fourth floor where my school is located, to a fight breaking out in front of me, to managing emergency fire drills and evacuations, three occurring in one day at one point. I worked up until the week of my due date, hoping my son would come sooner than later so I can maximize my leave. He arrived three days past due. <coughs> Excuse me. I then had to figure out how many days I would have to borrow. Do I borrow enough to cover my first six weeks and be indebted to the DOE, or do I not borrow any days and take the financial hit? 
Can I afford to do that in addition to paying for childcare for my first? Should I consider going back to work once my baby reached six weeks so I wouldn't be too deep in a financial hole? The amount of questions, concerns, worries, and stressors that a new parent has to carry is never ending. Working for an institution that is built on the basis of caring for children should not add on to that. It seems counterintuitive to have to provide reason as to why teachers should have a reasonable and stronger parental leave plan. Being able to provide for my children allows me to be more sane, which then allows my students to have an educator who can give from a full and sane cup. We live in a city that touts itself as innovators and leaders of progressive action. We have a mayor who has made it his, his agenda to recognize that a sane society includes systems that allow people to take care of their family, whether through UPK or renovating the city's parental leave plan. Educators, however, are somehow left out. The work that we do is deep and long and can never be accurately measured. For us to do this well and to show up 100% for our students, we need the financial security to take care of our own. I ask you to not only think about the immediate benefits and necessities that our families will gain, but the long-term effects our students and city will get when they have educators who are able to focus on their needs instead of financial instability. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, city council members. My name is Eric Rubin Perez, and I've been a school counselor at the John F. Kennedy Junior School for the past 14 years. I met my now husband in the spring of 2004. He was also in the field of education, working as a school psychologist in a school district on Long Island. Given our passion for education and love of children, it was inevitable that we would want a family of our own. We decided we wanted to create our family through a gestational surrogate. For those of you that don't know what it is, it's when an embryo is created from a separate egg donor and the sperm of my husband and myself, and then implanted into another woman. Yes, very complicated and also very expensive. Not an easy task for two public school educators. After eight long years, we finally had managed to save up the necessary money. Several more years to have the process work. I am telling you this to show you what my husband and I were willing to do to become parents. In the summer of 2013, we were finally on our way to becoming parents. As the months went by, we started planning for our daughter's arrival. At this point in my career, I had managed to save over 65 days in my bank that I had always planned on using for childcare leave. To my shock, I learned that as a father, I was only allowed to take three personal days. It didn't matter how many days I had saved, I was not able to use any of them. All those times I made the treacherous commute in the snow to my school in Elmhurst, Queens, from my home in Suffolk County, or coming back to work the day after I had or oral surgery didn't matter because I couldn't use any of my days. My husband, who worked on Long Island, got six weeks of paid paternity leave, so it never occurred to me that I wouldn't get anything. I worked in New York City, after all, a progressive city or so I had thought. Putting our da daughter in daycare at six weeks was not an option for us. We had worked too hard to get to this point. We decided for me to take un unpaid childcare leave for 11 weeks. On March 12th, 2014, at 8.12 p.m., our lives changed forever in the best possible way. We welcomed our first child, Ellie Renee Ruben Perez. As any proud dad, I brought photos. Here's my family. It was worth it all. However, being without pay from my new family was very traumatic, and it took a very long time to get out of the financial hole that we found ourselves in. We understand that by definition, being a parent is all about sacrificing, but there are easy, clear, progressive steps New York City could take to help families. 
Every day of my professional career, I give so much of myself to my students and the families I work with. But when I needed support as a new father, New York City's answer was no. Families are constantly changing and evolving. We need to adopt policies where every parent is given an equal opportunity. Thank you. I would like to thank the committee again for having us here, and I'm going to ask some questions. I have brought these shirts for you. They're not gifts for elected officials. These are shirts for you for UFT um, contingent uh, members that you all have. As you can see, we love taking care of New York City's children, but we take special pride in our own program for our UFT babies. Uh, but once again, thank you for having this hearing, and more importantly, we appreciate any advocacy you can do on behalf of this issue. Thank, thank you to President Mulgrew, um, who I believe is not just speaking up for just his union. I, th I think this movement is about all city municipal workers. Um, and I want to thank the educators for your courage to come here and testify on behalf of your children both at home, in the classroom, and of all city kids. It's extremely courageous of you, and I'm very proud to consider you my teacher family as well. I have a, some quick questions for <clears throat> President Mulgrew. You heard Commissioner Lynn mm -hmm. repeat over and over again about the pride of collective bargaining. Isn't it your understanding, isn't it, isn't it now no knowledge that the mayor's personnel order that implied to the 20,000 managerial positions did not take place through collective bargaining. Is that correct, President Absolutely, Mulder? did not take place. I don't know what union would have agreed to a benefit that cost them $5 million a year over what it would actually cost. No union would have agreed to that. Correct. So just to reiterate, a commissioner who works for the de Blasio administration who claims that this administration takes collective bargaining very serious, uh, was taking pride in a decision that was not rendered through collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. um, and you heard the exchange before between myself and the commissioner debating the fact that the city did profit from that decision. Yes. And Mr. President, can you explain why Commissioner Lynn was incorrect in his, in his understanding of, of that uh, decision? where he claims that it was not a benefit to the city of New York. It's, it's, I, Commissioner Lynn, if anyone who has to negotiate, has issues with math, to say the least. Uh, we've offered to give him classes with math tutors many times. Um, it's a very, this is a one-to-one -one straight up benefit. It's what did you get for the benefit from your workers and what did you pay out? It's really not that complicated. So what they received in the pay, what they got back by taking back the scheduled pay raise, and I did like the commissioner's way of dancing around the fact that he said he never took, took away. Well, yes, when people have it scheduled that they're getting a pay raise and you take it and they don't get it, that is taking away. Um, and the, and the uh, time they took back in days was the equivalent of $8.2 million. It's, it's pretty simple to figure that out. Uh, we have actuaries. We all have costing people on both sides. He paid out $2.4 million in a benefit. So eight, the city received $8.2 million last year, and it paid out $2.4 million. Not that complicated, but I will offer the commissioner again, if we, he needs a math tutor, we can help him out on this. Thank you, President Mulgrew, for, for crystallizing the point. Um, and is it, is it your belief that the administration is using that personnel order and decision to set the pattern for pattern collective bargaining across the board? I, I don't know about pattern of collective bargaining because my union is not, uh, its contract is still in effect. The thing is that the mayor, when he made his announcement, it said he wanted unions to come in quickly to negotiate it. It's clear from the commissioner's responses today that he had no intentions of negotiating it. He was trying to use it until the next round of bargaining. Those were his words. He didn't say it exactly like that, but that's what he was implying where, oh, no union, we haven't negotiated a new contract. Well, you don't need to come to an agreement on any issue. And, uh, own inside of contract negotiations. You can do those at any time. In fact, there are quite a few issues that have always worked out. Believe me, when the city needs an issue worked out, they come to us very quickly. 
So it is abundantly clear to me now that he's trying to use this as uh, a strategy because of the 77% female makeup of my union, which it then, again, yes, I will keep saying the word gender bias because I don't think he even understands that when we're talking about paid parental leave, we're talking about for any parent. But the archaic thought process is, oh, we'll go to the union first with the most amount, with the highest percentage of female workers. I believe this is a benefit that all city unions uh, will take part of. I, I appreciate that, President Mogru, and, and I also took issue with his characterization as if this is somehow a new phenomena or, or a new uh, issue that's being raised by labor and families. When I was still teaching, this was an issue that the UFT mm -hmm. took up. This has been an ongoing issue, and as I said to the commissioner, you know, coming to this council telling us that you struck labor deals with unions when you have very large reserves in the, in, in the absence of leadership in the last administration altogether, that's lowering the bar for us. And the part that was left out of that, he, he acts as if collective bargaining can solve everything, and I wish it was that way, but the reason we were in the position we were in is because there was an abuse of the collective bargaining process by the previous mayor. He chose not to do bargaining in a responsible way, which is why every single union in the city was out without a contract. He was literally trying to break collective bargaining pre historical precedent for the entire state of New York. So collective bargaining is something I fully support. But it, in, all, in order for it to solve problems, you need responsible parties not playing games on both sides. I understand the give and take of a negotiation process, but if you're trying to strategically do things because you have a nefarious ends, then you're not doing it in a responsible way. Uh, agreed, and, and the bottom line, it's, it's my concern <laughs> that they are now using a decision that was rendered through non-collective bargaining mm -hmm. to somehow set the tone and pace, which goes against the spirit of this progressive capital, goes against the spirit of being a city that says it stands with labor and supporting working families. I, I have a quick question for Ms. Uh, Dugan. Mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned, first of all, again, thank you for sharing your powerful story and for your, for your advocacy. You had mentioned that uh, you are in, in the negative when it comes to your yes. sick days. C can you can you just explain sure. elaborate so, on that? Um, my older daughter just turned six over the weekend. So when I had her, I had used all my sick days and then I had borrowed 20 days to stay on payroll. So that took me to the end of the year. So then I was able to make it to the summer. So with her, by the time I went back to work in September, I had been home with her for six months. So when I came back to work in September, I started with negative 20 days in my bank. Four years later, I got pregnant again, but I only, I had made it back to zero at that point. So it took, an, it, it took me four years to get back to, to zero. And then I got pregnant again, and I had no days. So I had to borrow days. Um, so then I had to borrow 20 days. So when I came back um, seven weeks after having my second daughter, I was negative 20 days. So over the course of two years, I've now made a little dent. I'm negative 17 days, but it's going to take, you know, it's going to take years to make that up. That that is correct. And and Mr. Perez, you had mentioned that you had accumulated a, a, a number of days that you cannot even utilize because they don't allow you. Is that correct? Yes, that that was correct. And how many days was that? What you said? At that point in my career, I had about 65 days. So you heard before when I said to the commissioner that we were looking for data about the, the breakdown between uh, male, female employees within the Department of Education who either retire, resign, or leave the system with the, re with the remaining number of sick days that they have left, which would, I think, provide a further glimpse in the inequities that, that are existing in the, the, the system. So you have negative days still, <coughs> and you have positive days still. So anecdotally, this is already proving, to the, to the President's point, to the point made by, by this committee, this is, this is exacerbating a gender equity gap 
within the system, and also, quite frankly, uh, it completely just going against the spirit of equity and fairness for all, for uh, adoptive parents, to, to foster a parent. It, it's mm. unbelievable the, the reaction that we received in the past week or two with, and again, I want to thank President Mulgrew and the UFT for, for their great advocacy, where a lot of folks came to me and said, we didn't know about this, in the sense where you have to declare a sickness to raise a family. That, that is so sick and twisted. In the 21st century in New York City, that you have to declare that you're sick when you're not. As you heard the commissioner say, he doesn't believe that his three grandchildren are illnesses. Well, neither is your child, and neither is your child, and neither is your child, and neither is the, ch the children of my colleagues. But yet, they have the audacity to, to continue to prolong this injustice, and I asked the commissioner, he was appointed in 2014, it is now 2018. Doesn't take four or five years to make a decision of this magnitude. I'd like to, uh, if my colleague, my co-chair, Jerome, to, to ask a few questions. Thank you, I'm gonna just uh, let Steve, uh, Council Member Steve Levin ask a quick question. Thank then you I'll very much. And then we'll follow up with Kalos Adams and Combo. Thank you very much for the courtesy, Chair Drum. Uh, very quick question for you, and I appreciate all of your testimony. And for the record, uh, President Mulgrew, I'm pissed off too. Um, but uh, I wasn't when I came in. I just listened to the <laughs> me person too. before me. Uh, um, I just want to just a point of clarification. Um, Commissioner Lynn said that it had never come up. Paid parental leave had never come up in the previous round of negotiations. The, that seems unlikely to me that not a Past single three rounds, this was a negotiating uh, bargain, uh, bargain uh, one of our bargaining uh, proposals for the last three rounds of negotiations. Uh, in fact, uh, the city's proposal last time was to not allow us to accrue 10 sick days. They said we should only be able to accrue five per year from now on, if you want to set the record straight, which would have really exacerbated the whole problem. So Commissioner Lynn was mistaken in... Uh, but we'll in leave it at that. Okay by saying that it never came up in 144 contract negotiations, the concept of paid parental leave between the years 2014 and 2016. It's, it's, it's always been a demand of ours. He inherited, I'm not sure where he came in on the process, but it was one of the demands through the arbitration which he was reviewing when he took over. Great, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the panel for coming in. I um, can really relate to what it is that you're talking about. You know, I'm familiar with these issues, having been a UFT chapter leader for almost 25 years. Your stories are very, very familiar to me, unfortunately. Um, I just wanted to ask Mr. Ruben Perez as well. Did you hear the OLR's commissioner's response to my question about how the policies of the city affect LGBT couples? Yes. How did that make you feel that he did not know how to answer those questions? Uh, you know, I mean, sad. I mean, it's... I mean, that's the best way to, that's the best way to say it. <laughs> I mean, to me, it was kind of shocking uh, that the person responsible for negotiating contracts did not have that information readily available to him. Um, can I ask also, what does your husband do? Uh, my husband is a school psychologist. And on he, Long Island? Yeah, he works in a school district on Long Interesting. Island. Interesting, and he gets benefits? Yeah, he gets six weeks paid. Was that negotiated? Um, I'm, I, ass I assume so. But, uh, but he does have those benefits. Yes, he does. Okay, so New York City is again behind uh, the rest of the, even the, the metropolitan area in this regard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm just curious, uh, President Mulgrew, do you know if any of the managers who did get the benefit the last time, are those people who work for the Department of Education? Uh, I'm assuming there are. So there are people within the Department of Education who do get the benefit, it's just not the teachers. Correct. That's absolutely incredible. Actually, when it first happened, I was in a room with a bunch of managers and I said, oh, how do you guys feel about that? And they were not happy. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's incredible, but not shocking to me. Like I said, having worked uh, for the DOE for 25 years, uh, these stories are often just too familiar. So thank you. I, I, that's really all I really wanted to ask today. So we're going to go on now to Council Member uh, Kalos. Good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. <laughs> thank you for the advocacy. Uh, where can I buy one of those uh, T-shirts for my uh, three-month-old daughter? Actually, you can't buy them. They're not for sale. 
you have to be a UFT per, uh, member who's expecting a child. Fair, fair enough. Uh, so I think all of us were a little disturbed by the administration. So I think, uh, let, let's start off. So all of us participated in, we were all excited. January 7, 2016, Mayor de Blasio and the First Lady announced historic uh, Mayor de Blasio, quote, the, the headline is Mayor de Blasio signs paid parental leave personal order for New York City workers. And I, I believe you were quoted, did you, did you believe at the time that paid family leave was imminently coming for what it says, New York City workers? Yes, I thought at that point we finally had a willing partner who wanted to do paid parental leave. And so we, we had Commissioner Lynn come here and testify. He seemed to indicate that this was something that hadn't been previously asked for. His testimony specifically said that uh, UFT was seeking uh, two retroactive raises. During those negotiations, did UFT ask for paid family leave? Yes. Actually, the last three rounds of negotiations, that has been a okay. one of our proposals. And, and so, there's a release, I'm, I'm reading it from January 7th. The, the mayor was positive about paid family leave. You were positive. At the time, were there initial conversations about paid family leave? Uh, I said, I'd be, uh, let's get working on this right away. Great, and, and how, how soon did they come back to you to start working on it? Uh, I believe it was a couple of months, and then I had to push it again, and then the problems were that by then, we had analyzed the package that, this, that the uh, managers had imposed on them. And, and so by that point, IBO comes out and, and says- A little while later. First, we kept saying it, and uh, OLR kept saying we were wrong, and then the IBO report came out, and then OLR was saying IBO is wrong. So it's one thing that, and I think that the administration was particularly proud of this, they, they kept saying at no cost to taxpayer, that this is actually a, a of profit to taxpayers, so mm -hmm. uh, I guess along those lines, so I guess one question is, have you ever had occasion where the city said, you know what, we should do the right thing and, and we should just offer something at the collective bargaining table without trying to take things back? Um, not since I've been president, but um, I mean, I was, I was, it was nice to hear the commissioner talk about the robust benefits package, but he forgot to say that every union worker in New York City has paid for for 50 years. When he talks about no health care premiums, he forgets to leave out what we have done, the fact that the city workers saved $3 billion in the last round of bargaining so that we could continue to have no premium health care options. It's an amazing thing to me how management always forgets. They act like they give you everything, and when the fact is you have to fight for every single thing you have. Uh, if I can just take a moment, that is precisely why I went into politics. I was a union side labor lawyer. They were doing the Delphi bankruptcy, and all these executives were taking golden parachutes, and all these folks were losing their pensions. And yep. these folks had given up pay increases. They had given up health insurance. They had given up everything for their pensions, which the bankruptcy law changed so that they could uh, see them gone. So uh, I guess as, as we are here today, we, we've heard some of the stories from your members about what they've been through, and I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I am sorry for what you've gone through. I will say that I'm a, a new parent. I took, I, I'm taking my, I, I'm doing 12 weeks. The city council doesn't actually have a, as far as I know, a paid family leave policy for council members. So I've been just trying to lead by example by taking 12 weeks. I did five weeks, I'm gonna take another seven, and uh, I, I would just see. So we, we, have a, 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 we have a gentleman at the table, and I guess one question would be, uh, or, or for, for everyone here, <coughs> parenting is important. If we get this, do we see both men and women who are members and also gender non-conforming members taking more paid family leave when they need it, whether it's for children or for family members who need the care? Um, that's, I mean, I, I, don't really know, I don't really know how to answer that. I mean, I think right now, you know, for so many, uh, especially you have team workers, I mean, it's not even an option. So, I mean, I, I would hope that, you know, if, if uh, paid paternity leave did pass, it, it would be an option and more men um, will be able to take advantage of that. I don't want to go into the technicalities and negotiations. Uh, 
we know, average-wise, how many families uh, bring children in because of our medical coverage. So we know amongst the membership over five years what the average is. So we know what we're solving for. I just want to be clear. So it's not like there will be a new escalation. We already know that's the delta we're solving for right now because we can tell by children being added into our medical coverages, families that are bringing children, uh, are having children or, or, or adopting children or bringing children in to care for. Last question. Although you are not part of pattern collective bargaining in the same way as some of the other labor organizations, is it possible that this administration is trying to drive the hardest bargain with uh, UFT in order to set a precedence for every other employee in the city of New York? Could be. It's clear to me that there is agenda bias in what they're doing with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Cumbo. Thank you. Wanted to find out more about, um, as Councilmember Traeger brought up, I didn't understand it as far as the sick days. So in order for you to gain your sick days back, how do you do that? Is it just over a period of working, you would start to pick up your sick days again and accrue those days? Or would you have to do something like, let's just say, and I apologize, I don't know that much about your industry, but could you work and do summer school and thereby make up additional days? Or how exactly do you make up those days? By not taking your sick days, by working and not using your sick days. So you accrue one sick day per month. Um, I'll, the lady should talk about this because it really is, what goes on is quite bad. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how the summer school works, but every month you get one school day, you get one um, sick day. So right now I owe 10 days to the DOE. So for the next 10 months that I work, I would be expected to not take a day off in order for me to be able to get out of the negative. Wow. Yeah. So moving forward, after you take those days, you can no longer take those additional days because now you owe time. Yeah. And if you were to take a day, you would be docked pay? At this point right now, I have the choice of I can borrow day. I still have 10 days that I could borrow from the DOE because I didn't use all 20 of the days. Mm -hmm. So I can borrow one of, I can still borrow those days, but then those are days I owe back. Or I can just take the financial hit and not get paid at all for that day. Oh, wow. And, and co my colleague, I just want to also just give you one extra tidbit very quickly. When they, when the teachers are also in the negative when it comes to their days, uh, their, th their checks that they receive even during, during the summer months, because again, the pay is annualized. People think they get paid in the summer, they don't. The pay is annualized. Their summer pay goes down as well. Mm. So it has a cascading financial effect on them throughout the entire year as well. It's, a, it's the most convoluted system. I mean, the UFT has to have workshops just so women can come and figure out how they're taking maternity leave. I had to attend twice because each situation is different. And if you work in a building, um, you know, a lot of times each person has a different story depending on when the baby's due, if um, there's bed rest involved, or if they're, you know, if the baby, God forbid, is in the NICU. I mean, there's different things that come into play, um, but everybody has a different story. And then a lot of people don't realize that it's not paid until they're pregnant and then they go to the maternity workshop and they come back and they say, do you know this was not a paid leave? <laughs> You're using all your sick days. I just want to add mm -hmm. on to that also. I didn't realize the summer, that my summer pay would be cut until after I had my first daughter. And when I called around asking what happened, I was missing like hundreds of dollars in my check. I was told I've, I'm acting as if an injustice was done to me because I had a child. Wow. I really, I mean, you all have really uncovered something that we just simply didn't know existed at this level. And for me, it's very personal, and, and all of your stories are very emotional, because I had my son in August, and my election was in September. So for me, we all have different stories, but I understand in a way that I would have never understood before, that when you're carrying a child, it's like you've been given this and this is just me, everybody has a different understanding. You've been given this sacred responsibility from God, from the universe, that every decision that you make is so critical to you. Every staircase you walk up, you wonder. Every 
train that someone doesn't offer you a seat and you're standing, every time that you're stressed out or yelling at someone or you have a stressful encounter or you have to walk because the bus is not coming or all of these different things make you have to wonder if you're taking your responsibility the way that you should. And then you manage that with at the same time, you know that money is also a critical part of bringing a child into the world. So you wanna make sure that you have enough diapers, you have enough wipes, you have enough books, you have enough brain stimulation toys and all these, you wanna give your child the best. And so having to balance that whole, do I have enough money and am I making the right decision by not walking up the stairs or am I making the right decision by snapping my fingers and saying to someone on the train, you better get up, because I'm about to have a baby, you know? You have all these different things, and so I really relate with so many of your experiences, because I had to make those decisions, too, in terms of the safety and the health and well-being of my baby. And parents should just not have to have to weigh those types of decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm committed working with my colleagues because we cannot continue to have families have to make such decisions or weighing options or, or bargaining around something about human life which is so critical. So I thank you all for your testimonies and for being here today. Thank you. And um, just before we let this panel go, just a couple of my own personal observations from having been a teacher also majority leader. You know, um, some schools are f at least five stories high, right. and mm -hmm. to see uh, pregnant teachers, especially in their last few months of pregnancy, walking up and down those stairs is absolutely right. incredible. I've also had a situation in a school where I was at where the principal would not give a key to the teacher to use the elevator, uh, and sometimes you can't do it because you have to have somebody else walk the class upstairs. Uh, because they have the kids have to be escorted up the stairs. Right. So not only are the teachers walking up the stairs, they're also escorting 34 children along with them up the stairs. Uh, and then as a teacher, there's never really any coming in late, you know, because uh, a right. substitute teacher has to be called. So it's not as if you can go to the doctor in the morning and come back to work, you know, as right. we oftentimes can do in our jobs here. There's no coffee, you know, break, um, and there's no bathroom break. You know, and these are the conditions that pregnant teachers have to work under all the time in our public school system. Wow. And so that's why we really, really must look at this issue that's uh, right. further as we go down the road and, and support our teachers. And I think with that, we'll ask that this panel say thank you to this panel for coming in. And thank we'll you ask much. our next panel to come up. Thank you all. I'll leave these for you. And a special hello to 721. <laughs> okay. My district. Good to see you. All right, our next panel, Molly Weston Williamson, uh, A Better Balance. Eric Williams uh, from the New York Paid Leave Coalition. Uh, Kay Sid, representing herself. And Melissa Dorsimus, a uh, New York City DOE teacher. Okay, Kai said, I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. Uh, thank you. All right, so, um, Sergeant, are you ready? All right, um, let's start over here, and everybody's going to be on a three-minute clock. All right? That's on? Okay. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon and thank you, Committee Chair Traeger and Committee Chair Durham, uh, and members of the Committee on Education and the Committee of Civil Service and Labor for allowing me to testify today. Um, I'm here to speak to you about something of critical importance, paid parental leave for our city's teachers, as you just heard my colleagues share as well. 
Uh, my name is Melissa Dorsmas. I have been a New York City teacher for six years, teaching special education in the Bronx and Manhattan, spanning grades six through nine. In addition to being a classroom teacher, I've been a school culture leader, department team leader, and new teacher mentor. This fall, I will add mother to my list of roles when I welcome my first child. Uh, over the past six years, I have spent 6,480 hours caring for and educating the children of New York City. In return, I'm asking the city for 360 paid hours for me to be able to care for my own child. When you look at the numbers, it doesn't seem like much to ask for. When I started teaching at the age of 24, I knew that New York City schools didn't offer maternity leave. Even then, I knew that someday I would want to be a mother. So I had to start planning and accumulating sick, sick leave. In the past, I've been able to push through and go to work with the flu or a sinus infection. Recently, however, being pregnant has not been easy for me. I have faced some early complications with my pregnancy, which means I have to make the impossible choice between staying home to take care of myself and my unborn child or having the time off from my job to care for him after he is born. Being put in a position where I am forced to go to work when I'm sick doesn't help me get better, doesn't help me be a better educator, and it certainly does not help my future child. But for the teachers of New York City who are parents or are planning on becoming parents, this is the impossible position the city and state have put us in. Without standard paid time off, the city is also discriminating against teachers who choose to be parents. An unequal system of guaranteed paid family leave makes parenthood seem like a selfish choice that is judged and stigmatized within schools. Currently in many schools, teacher leaders put their career advancement and reputation on the line when they decide to have a child of their own. I've taught in schools where if you missed work, you were seen as weak. And I left because I couldn't imagine taking maternity leave there. I knew the administration would blame me for being absent, causing additional work for my colleagues and pass me over for leadership opportunities. With paid leave protected, we can work to end the stigmatization of taking care of yourself that haunts so many educators. One quick note, I use the word parent deliberately throughout because I'm not just talking about mothers needing paid time off, but both parents, no matter their gender or family composition. They, like my husband, who is also a city employee without paid leave, deserve time with their newborn child. I hope that by the time I welcome my son in November that I can count on the benefit of paid parental leave. It would be such a relief during a time when I will have enough to worry about. Uh, Governor Como's paid family leave website says New York has the nation's strongest paid family leave policy. And I urge you committee members to extend to us what state and city law gives so many other New Yorkers. I also ask that you restitute the sick time to teachers that still currently in the system who had to use their sick days to care for their newborn. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Next, please. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Kai Sid. Thank you for holding this hearing on extending paid family leave to unionized city workers. I work for the Department of Education as an outreach specialist in the Pre-K for All initiative. As an outreach specialist, my job is to educate families about the importance of early childhood um, education for their four-year-old children and now three-year-olds and even younger, and to connect families with programs like Head Start and Early Learn, among other services, to better serve their families. Um, I care about the well-being of young children and families throughout the city, and I was very pleased when I found out that the law proposed by Cuomo to offer paid maternity leave to workers in the state. I was even happier to find out that my Nigerian workers working directly for the city would also benefit from this law. Um, but when, so when I found out that I was pregnant in May of 2017, I was optimistic about benefiting of the new law. Since I work for the city and my job is related to early childhood education, I felt that the city and my union would have my back. After all, as a single mom with no immediate family or relatives in the U.S., I did all the help that I can get. When I looked closely to the law, I realized that I, as a public employee, I was not covered under the state law. After that realization, I continued my research regarding the mayoral executive order, and I was also disappointed to learn that I also wasn't covered by it because I'm not a managerial staff. Confused, I reached out to my union. I am a member of DC 37, local 372. It was very frustrating and disappointing to hear mixed versions and misinformation from different staff there. 
It gave me the impression that nobody knew what the state negotiations with the city were at that point, and I was correct. I was already seven months along, and I still had not gotten a definitive answer regarding the state of negotiations. I knew that that law went into effect on January 1st, and I was due in February. To this date, I have still yet to hear from my union um, what the state of negotiations are. And uh, to be honest, what they have achieved 15 months afterwards, and so even four months after the state already is in place. For all that matters, they could keep negotiating for the next 15 years until my daughter is already in her quinceanera party. Um, we are being held, my little family and I, we are being held hostage in this bargaining process. In my opinion, the law might as well could have spelled out that every New Yorker would benefit except if you're female or, a, or work for the city, serve children or have a family. The way this law is being interpreted is perverse and obscene, and I totally, well, I'll interpret. Why do the mostly female workforce that provides children and family services in the city have to jump through hoops to benefit from this entitlement? This is almost equivalent to having the state minimum wage raised for everyone except for women of color or women that work for the city. The fact that the application of this policy is subject to negotiations is obscene in all levels. This benefit is being used as leverage against all the demands and it will depend on the person bargaining on our behalf to see if it comes into effect or not. Last year, when I reached out to my union to demand a recap on the negotiation advances, I was told that most likely nobody in my unit will ever get to benefit from this law. The reason being, the reason that was given to me was because most of the, all the other workers that uh, form part of my unit are older women that much rather uh, spend more attention, like seeing this um, negotiations go in towards um, retirement money rather than paid family leave. This is anti-democratic and demoralizing. From the get-go, my union warned me, already let me know, that I most likely will never benefit from this legislation because it is not a priority for them. I was appalled to have union representatives laugh at my face when demanding to get more information. I am livid, I was livid, and I feel betrayed by my union that is not putting enough effort into this negotiation, that is not informing me about the state of negotiations, nor will include me in the conversation. This process from the start is subject to manipulation, and the only ones held hostage in this scheme are new moms like me and our babies. We are, for them, collateral damage. I urge City Council to pass a resolution mandating that the city stops their politicking and actually moves into implementation of this law for all workers, but especially for female workers of color that work for the city and the ones that also serve children and families, making it retroactive to January 1, 2018. I also urge City Council to implement a monitoring structure to correct gender imbalances and equity throughout this process. It should be mandated the same way that it is private for private employers. If small nonprofits and mom and pop shops are mandated to do it throughout the state, what is happening that city employees represented by unions can't benefit or can't enjoy this? Just a note, when I pay taxes as a taxpayer, and I pay city taxes, and I pay state taxes, I don't get a discount for being a woman of color, and I'm not being benefited by these policies. Thank you, my name is Kai Sid. Okay, thank you. Next, please. Um, hi, uh, my name is Eric Williams. I'm the campaign director for the New York Paid Leave Coalition. We were one of the lead groups that helped get the state law passed uh, here in New York State, uh, as well as uh, having many of the leaders of pass the pay sick time law in New York City as well. Um, we're here to support the uh, municipal workers getting access to paid family leave uh, and would love to answer questions about how the state law uh, works and how it's gone into effect as, as of January 1st of this year. Um, but at the end of the day, when we're talking about you know what makes up a good paid family leave policy, uh, what we're looking at is one that's not, it, it is inclusive of 
uh, both parents and um, the family. Oh. Okay. Do I need to start over on the microphone? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you have right, a loud so voice. I thought it was on. Okay. Yes. So. Um, one that's both inclusive of new parents, but also the other types of caregiving needs. Um, with the, the law that went into effect in New York State, it covers both um, adoption, foster care placement, and the birth of a new child. Uh, covers both parents. And it uh, also allows for uh, caring for a seriously ill family member, uh, as well as certain issues that arise related to a family member's, member's military deployment. So. Uh, we'd like to urge kind of a more comprehensive look beyond just parental leave. Um, and we have been doing quite a bit of public education around the new paid family leave law. And uh, almost every time, if not several people uh, come up to me and say, you know, I would love to have this, but I work for the city, so I don't have access to any paid family leave. Uh, and so they leave dejected there. They don't know quite what to do and how to piece together. You know, we've heard a lot about teachers having to piece together sick time to use this. Uh, and the rea reality is that this is something that only happens a couple of times in someone's life. Uh, usually uh, one or two children, maybe three children, maybe having to care for a seriously ill family member uh, late in their life or when they have a major, a serious uh, illness. And so it doesn't happen very often. And so that's why you, when you look at the, um, the benefit and the contribution that employees pay through the state uh, benefit, the cost is rel relatively low because it just isn't used all that much, but those key times when it really needs to be used, it's very important to have access to that benefit and have a minimum. Um, during our campaign, we had several medical professionals say that 12 weeks of leave is the absolute minimum, uh, and that even just gets us up into the baseline of international standard, like the bottom level of international standard. So uh, when we're talking about how much leave should be offered, um, you know, the state program will go up to, uh, over the next couple of years, 12 weeks of leave at a two-thirds wage replacement rate. Um, and really, you know, one of the other things about this is that workers, you know, having to think about using and accruing benefits uh, the way that it is with many of the municipal workers, um, people tend to have children when they're younger and earlier in their career, which means that, um, you know, there, as you saw, many people will have to pay this back over a long period of time and may, you know, may take years and years to uh, recover from this. So uh, that's why it's important to have this benefit and have it be, uh, you know, across the board. And, you know, we, we think about it in three ways, uh, making sure that it's accessible to the workers that need it, affordable, uh, and an adequate uh, benefit while they're on leave. Uh, and so. You know, we see that these types of policies, the reason that it's a state kind of uh, covers all private sector workers, is that you do see those improved health outcomes. You see it increasing uh, and, and alleviating the gender, uh, gender gap, both at home and at work. Um, and so that's, we feel that that's important for the city's municipal workforce as well. Okay, thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon. My name is Molly Weston Williamson, and I'm an attorney with a better balance. Along with our colleagues at the coalition, we were among the leading members of the coalition that fought for and won New York's paid family leave law and continue to be part of implementing that law. We run a free and confidential legal hotline for workers with questions under the paid family leave law. We also play a key role as a national organization in advancing paid family and medical leave laws around the country, including supporting efforts to expand paid leave benefits for public sector workers in many municipalities. We thank the councils for holding this hearing and appreciate the opportunity to testify today. At A Better Balance, we believe that all workers deserve the right to take the leave they need when they and their families need it. We strongly support the idea of expanding access to paid leave for municipal workers. Through our hotline, we hear firsthand from city workers who want and need paid leave but do not currently have access to it. In pursuit of this goal, we wanted to call your attention to a fact that actually the co-chairs have both called attention to today, the fact that the state law allows municipal unions to opt into coverage under the law through the bargaining process. This option, which we see as one tool in the toolkit of achieving this goal, offers some significant advantages. As you know, today the law offers covered workers the right to up to eight weeks of paid family leave at 50% of their own average weekly wage, up to a maximum of about $650 a week. By state regulation, an insurance policy that meets the state's requirements costs just 0.126% of the covered employee's wages, up to a maximum of about $86 per year. 
Purchasing this low-cost insurance option would be substantially less expensive than paying for leave 100% out of pocket and would save the city a great deal of money even if, as we would expect and advise, the city topped off the insurance benefit to provide full pay to workers on leave. Although the wage replacement rate and benefit cap in the paid family leave law provide a minimum benefit, the city can and should do better for its employees. <coughs> Therefore, we recommend treating this insurance product as a subsidy to providing this benefit. And the subsidy may become even more valuable over time as benefits under the law become more generous, although the exact premium rate will be adjusted by the state each year. Moreover, as our colleagues have called attention to, the state program covers leave to bond with a new child, but also to care for a seriously ill or injured loved one, or to address needs arising out of a close family member's military deployment. Because all three purposes, which cover needs across the life cycle, are included in the cost-controlled insurance coverage, providing comprehensive coverage would be inexpensive while offering significant additional protection to workers. We thank you again for the opportunity to provide this testimony. You can find more detail in our written remarks, and we're happy to take any questions about the paid leave law either here or in states around the country. Thank you. Okay, Chair Traeger. I want to thank this uh, panel for very informative information, and thank you for your advocacy as well. Just to have a question for the, uh, uh, for the folks that worked on the statewide campaign. Um, do you know how many municipalities in New York State have opted in to the paid leave policy so far? I, I do not know that. It's something we're certainly supportive of, but I, I'm not aware of any statistics on that something, and if you find out, we'd love to hear as well. So is it your understanding that the answer is zero? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to how many municipalities. We can definitely look into it and see if we can you know, research the answer or uh, potentially ask the folks at the, the state um, how many have opted in so far. We're at the early stages, so they may have, you know, over this next, you know, it started January 1 of this year, and so for some municipal workers that are opting in through collective bargaining, just as within New York City, that's done on a, a particular schedule. So that might be part of the factor that over this next you know, few months, the next year, the next couple years, we may see uh, municipalities opting in. But it's also possible that there are some that have opted in um, already through to the, the state program. And, and I appreciate your uh, testimony when you said that uh, folks are calling in your hotline for city workers who are frustrated that th this does not apply to them. And that is what we're dealing with all the time. And, and the volume has increased only because of all these announcements about paid leave. And people are you know, researching that it does not apply to them. It does not apply to over 90% of the city's workforce. Um, and uh, it's, you know, I, I just know people in, in my profession, the teaching profession, that left. They just could not afford it. And, and, and the resounding theme over and over again is that they felt they were being punished for raising a family. So thank you for validating what we already uh, have, have, have heard. Thank you for your advocacy. And uh, we're not going to stop until there's a true, truly paid leave policy for all families. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, but there, I don't think we have any further questions. We thank this panel for coming in and for sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, we look forward to continuing this discussion. Thank you very, very much. Great. Okay, and with that, I will say that this meeting is adjourned at 10 minutes after 4. Yeah, 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 definitely.